This young man ran past Megumi and suddenly smelled a peculiar scent, prompting him to follow up and ask for details. It turned out that Megumi was searching for a lost special grade cursed object, which had been picked up by Yuji. Megumi demanded that Yuji quickly hand over the cursed object. The seal on the cursed object was loosening, attracting a large number of monsters. Yuji mentioned that he had given the cursed object to a senior. Upon hearing this, Megumi immediately lost his composure and rushed to the school, where the senior had already broken the seal. It was a finger. Suddenly, after a loud noise, a sense of oppression hit them head on. Megumi told Yuji to stay put while the girls hid in fear. However, the senior nearby was already being corrupted by a monster. They were discovered by the monster. Megumi was still on his way, saw a monster blocking the path, and immediately summoned a jade dog, which he then used to crush the monster on the spot. When Megumi found the senior, they were already being absorbed by the monster and could no longer be saved. Yuji broke through a window and punched the monster, heroically rescuing the seniors. When Yuji wanted to see what the monster looked like, it was instantly killed by Megumi. Megumi informed Yuji that the special grade cursed object was a finger of Ryomen Sukuna, and the monsters wanted it because eating it would grant them powerful cursed energy. Suddenly, a monster appeared from the ceiling. After a loud noise, Megumi was grabbed and thrown violently, losing his ability to fight completely. Just then, Yuji came to the rescue, but it was ineffective because defeating the monster required the use of curse techniques. Things took a turn for the worse when Yuji was punched into the air. When the cursed object fell, Yuji said that only by gaining cursed energy could he save everyone. After swallowing the cursed object, Yuji burst out with astonishing power, capable of instantly killing the attacking monster. Yuji had transformed, now with four eyes, as his body had been taken over by the cursed spirit Sukuna, who threatened a massacre, but was soon reclaimed by Yuji. Megumi now saw Yuji as a monster that needed to be dealt with on the spot. Suddenly, their teacher, Gojo Satoru, appeared. After understanding the situation, he knew that Yuji could switch bodies with Sukuna and instructed Yuji to switch back after 10 seconds. Gojo Satoru, the strongest man, faced Sukuna's attack. He clapped his hands together, dodging all attacks while Sukuna could only hit the air. The teacher fought while also taunting Sukuna, treating him like a monkey, creating a large hole in the school. When he thought the fight was over, the teacher was unharmed and began a countdown. Once the time was up, Sukuna was confused because Yuji had taken his body back. Gojo Satoru then gently tapped Yuji on the forehead, causing him to faint. When Yuji woke up, according to the rules of the Jujutsu Academy, he had been sentenced to death, but it was a suspended execution. The teacher then picked up another finger and smashed it against the wall. He told Yuji that these indestructible fingers, totaling 20 because Sukuna had four arms, were increasing in cursed energy. The academy currently had six, and the speed of sealing them could not keep up. To eradicate the monstrous Sukuna, the higher-ups ordered Yuji to swallow all the fingers before executing him. This way, Sukuna would also disappear. Otherwise, he would be executed on the spot. After saying this, they took Yuji to eat the fingers. Yuji, having swallowed the second finger, was in excruciating pain. The teacher beside him got ready to fight, but after a while, Yuji returned to normal. Then the teacher took him to the Jujutsu Academy, telling Yuji that he was the third first-year student, and there was another female student. On their way to the academy, Yuji followed the teacher to register at the academy. On the way there, Sukuna broke out and was very articulate. It turned out that this guy had existed for a thousand years. Afterward, all the Jujutsu sorcerers were deployed to subdue him, but all attempts ended in failure. Yuji, standing by, asked the teacher who was stronger. The teacher told him, I am invincible. Now having swallowed Sukuna's fingers, Yuji had arrived to report to the principal. Upon meeting, the principal asked Yuji why he wanted to become a Jujutsu sorcerer. Yuji said, he just wanted to help others. Suddenly, the principal summoned a little monster and punched Yuji. Yuji got serious. After a sprint, he flattened the little monster's face with a punch. The little monster, like having eaten the rubber fruit, not only had the properties of rubber, but was also extremely fast and indestructible. After warning Yuji, it smashed into Yuji's face, then danced triumphantly, leaving Yuji dumbfounded. Suddenly, Yuji was hit again, flipping 360 degrees on the spot. 
When he faced the little monster's attack again, Yuji, whose meridians were opened, instantly dodged and headbutted, and finally put the little monster in a naked chokehold. He told the principal about the chokehold, that only he could swallow Sukuna's fingers. He couldn't escape this mission, so he wanted to become a Jujutsu sorcerer. He didn't want to feel regret. After hearing this, the principal was very satisfied with Yuji's answer. Just like that, Yuji received the principal's approval. Then they went to meet another female student. She was Nobara. Gojo Satoru, the teacher, said he would take them for a tour. Gojo Satoru then took them to see the world, leading them to a cursed, abandoned building. The teacher told them to eliminate the monsters inside because he wanted to see their strength. He then handed Yuji a kitchen knife, since Yuji didn't know Jujutsu. He also cautioned him not to let Sukuna out, then ran inside. To increase efficiency, they split up. Suddenly, Yuji hit the jackpot. A monster dropped from above his head, scaring him so much that he quickly pulled out the kitchen knife to calm his nerves. The monster, like it had ADHD, kept shaking its head. The next second, it attacked Yuji. Yuji stabbed the monster in the chest with a knife. After the monster lost its ability to move, Yuji jumped into the air. He plunged the knife into the monster's head. Yuji felt he was incredibly cool. At that moment, Nobara upstairs noticed something off about a dummy nearby and pulled out a hammer to fight. She imbued her nails with cursed energy and hammered down, hitting the monster's head directly. Suddenly, the monster opened its eyes and with a snap of her fingers, Nobara drove two more nails into the dummy's head until it exploded. The next moment, Nobara spotted a child hiding in the corner. A monster emerged from the wall and grabbed the child with one hand. Seeing this, Nobara immediately halted her attack, realizing the monster was intelligent and was using the child as a hostage. After a mental struggle, Nobara reluctantly lowered her weapon. Yet, the monster still didn't release the child. Just as Nobara was losing hope, a giant fist stretched out from the wall, startling the monster. Yuji sliced off the monster's arm with one cut, then kicked it, saving the child. The panicked monster tried to flee. As it ran past the wall, Nobara threw a straw doll toward the monster's arm, then quickly hammered a nail with force. At that moment, the monster was struck mid-air, likely unaware of how it met its end. Suddenly, an emergency arose. A special grade cursed spirit appeared at the juvenile detention center. The higher-ups sent Yuji and others to rescue the hostages. Unfortunately, Gojo Satoru was away on a business trip. The man with glasses warned them to avoid fighting the special grade cursed spirit and to run for their lives. Thus, Yuji and his group ventured in. Deep inside, they discovered the hostages were already dead. As Yuji tried to retrieve the bodies, Megumi pulled him away telling him those bodies weren't worth bothering over. Suddenly, Nobara fell into a dark pit, and nearby, the Jade Hound was also gone. Seeing this, Megumi urged Yuji to escape. The next second, a special grade cursed spirit appeared before them. The overwhelming oppression left both of them unable to move. After struggling for a while, Yuji pulled out a sharp kitchen knife and swung at the cursed spirit, resulting in Yuji losing a hand. Faced with this dire situation, Yuji called for Sukuna's help, but Sukuna refused. Suddenly, the cursed spirit launched an attack, astonishing Megumi with its destructive power. Seeing their doom imminent, Yuji immediately told Megumi to find Nobara and then to get her out of there, signaling him after they were safe because he planned to release Sukuna. After telling him, Megumi went to find Nobara, and Yuji prepared for a desperate fight. Suddenly, with a sweep of its hand, the cursed spirit blasted Yuji away. Another strike created a huge hole in the wall. As the cursed spirit prepared to deliver the final blow, Yuji quickly rose to block the attack. His human body was utterly incapable of stopping the attack. After a flash, Yuji was overwhelmed. Now he realized how weak he truly was. Recalling that the source of cursed spirit stemmed from negative human emotions, he fully awakened, clenched his fist, and transformed negative emotions into strength releasing it with his punch. Unfortunately, this attack had no effect on the cursed spirit. Meanwhile, Megumi successfully rescued Nobara. At that moment, Yuji gave a slight smile and released Sukuna. Facing the special grade cursed spirit, Sukuna acted as if he was merely playing with a monkey. At that moment, the enraged cursed spirit formed a Rasengan and hurled it fiercely towards Sukuna. Calmly, Sukuna blocked the attack with one hand. Sukuna told him, 
your nightmare has just begun. After saying this, he grabbed the cursed spirit's head, followed by a kick. The ground collapsed instantly. The next second, it fell into a sewage ditch. Meanwhile, Megumi asked the man with glasses to take Nobara to the hospital, while he waited here for Yuji to return. Looking back, this poor special grade cursed spirit had been punched into the wall by Sukuna, but it was able to heal itself. Regrowing its limbs, it seemed to feel capable again. Seeing it so pleased, Sukuna decided to show it the true art of curses. With a gesture from Sukuna, his domain unfolded, and instantly everything around changed. The terrified cursed spirit was killed on the spot. Finally, Sukuna retrieved his own finger. After the battle, the special grade cursed spirit was burned to ash. Outside, Megumi, realizing the special grade cursed spirit had been eliminated, waited for Yuji's return. Suddenly, Sukuna appeared behind him and told him Yuji wasn't coming back. Then he made a shocking move, plunging his hand into his own body and pulling out his heart, because he planned to use Yuji as a hostage. As a cursed spirit, he didn't need a heart to survive, and Yuji would die once he switched bodies back. Then he consumed a third finger, and Sukuna's power greatly increased. Facing this dire situation, Megumi had to fight. After a gesture, he summoned a giant bird to battle. Sukuna evaded Megumi's attacks with his hands in his pockets, showing complete confidence. The disparity in their strengths was immense. Megumi couldn't touch him. Suddenly, Sukuna caught Megumi's fist with one hand, then slapped him. But Megumi didn't fall, instead using the opportunity to summon a giant serpent, which bit Sukuna and took him into the sky. But it seemed ineffective against Sukuna, who killed the serpent with a smile. Before Megumi could react, he was caught by Sukuna, thrown into the air, and then kicked. The force of the kick was such that Megumi couldn't stop, but luckily, the bird saved him in time. However, under the overwhelming power, Megumi had no escape. After a thick smoke, Megumi was completely out of options, as all his shikigami, except for the giant bird, had been destroyed by Sukuna. Sukuna didn't immediately finish him off, instead praising Megumi's skillful use of curses. He didn't understand why Megumi chose to flee when facing a special grade cursed spirit. Suddenly, Megumi adopted a new posture, and the look in his eyes suddenly excited Sukuna, who also became fascinated by him. It seemed Sukuna knew something. Perhaps Megumi could bring him back to life. As they were about to start fighting, Megumi told Yuji that he had never regretted saving him because he didn't want to see such a kind Yuji die like that. After saying this, Yuji came back. But having lost his heart, he immediately collapsed. Meanwhile, a new enemy appeared. This enemy entered a restaurant where the staff only saw a long-haired human man. They couldn't see the cursed spirit. Their goal was to defeat all the sorcerers, starting with sealing Gojo Satoru and then trying to recruit Sukuna. Since the long-haired man at the table wasn't ordering anything, the manager asked an employee to find out what was going on. Realizing something was terribly wrong with these guests, the employee immediately quit and ran out. Left with no choice, the manager confronted the situation himself. Suddenly, the man burst into flames, causing a nearby employee to scream in terror. It turned out to be Jogo's doing. It didn't end there. The flames spread to other people in the restaurant, sparing no one. Jogo, who possessed the ability to control flames, planned to go after Gojo Satoru next. Yuji, who was already dead, lay in the morgue waiting for the autopsy. However, Yuji had not completely died yet. In his inner world, he met the high and mighty Sukuna. Yuji picked up a bone from the ground and threw it at Sukuna, but it only produced smoke without causing any harm. After dodging the attack, Yuji rushed up and started hitting and kicking Sukuna, but it was all in vain as he could only take hits. Then Sukuna sat on Yuji and told him that he would revive him if he agreed to two conditions. First, whenever he said the word contract, Yuji must give his body to Sukuna for one minute. Second, he must forget this agreement, and during this minute, Sukuna would not kill indiscriminately. With no better options, Yuji reluctantly agreed, as staying there was unbearable. Just as the coroner was about to make the first cut, Yuji suddenly got up, terrifying everyone around. After making the contract with Sukuna, Yuji was revived. The teacher expressed dissatisfaction with the higher-ups arrangement, as they intended to use this rescue mission to eliminate the threat posed by Yuji. 
To ensure Yuji's safety going forward, the teacher took the revived Yuji to enhance his abilities, teaching him to control the output of his cursed energy by watching horror films. Thus, Yuji spent the whole day watching movies in his room. Meanwhile, after returning to school, Megumi was still depressed and hadn't gotten over Yuji's death. Suddenly, the second-year seniors arrived. Maki, the senior skilled in using cursed tools, and Toje, who covered his mouth, were there. Most surprisingly, a panda that behaved like a human was also present, along with a senior named Okutsu, who was overseas on a business trip. He appeared to be not only strong, but also very handsome. The seniors came to inform them that sorcerers from two schools would be engaging in an exchange. Determined to become stronger, Nobara and Megumi decided to train with the seniors. On the other side, after seeing Yuji well-trained, Gojo Satoru was relieved and rode in a car with a bespectacled man, heading towards the principal's place. Suddenly, the teacher got out of the car, sensing an imminent danger. Just then, Jogo arrived and immediately threw a small volcano against the wall. After a dense cloud of smoke dissipated, Jogo thought the battle was over and was taken by surprise. The flames around the teacher gradually faded away. Seeing this, Jogo quickly summoned several Firestone insects to deal with the teacher. Suddenly, under a burst of intense light, the insects self-destructed. But the teacher, who could teleport, wasn't even scratched. Yet it wasn't over. Jogo delivered a powerful palm strike to the teacher's back, a strike so strong it would leave nothing but ashes. At that moment, displaying a king-like demeanor, remarking that even the so-called strongest human was just that. But he was shocked when he saw that Gojo Satoru, the teacher, was completely unharmed. The teacher told him, your attack didn't even reach me. With an invincible defensive technique, the closer objects got to him, the slower they moved, never actually reaching him. After explaining this, the teacher grabbed Jogo and delivered a strike to his stomach, causing him to spit out blood. Next, the teacher formed a red energy ball in his hand. After a flash of red light and a powerful blast, Jogo was sent flying thousands of kilometers away, and Jogo had nowhere to escape. Grabbing his head, the teacher then rubbed it against the ground vigorously. Frustrated, Jogo randomly blasted everything around him. Suddenly, the teacher appeared behind him and delivered a kick. As Jogo struggled to get up, looking disheveled and trying to locate the teacher, the teacher unexpectedly brought Yuji along for a live teaching session. Hearing this, Jogo sensed an opportunity because he thought Yuji would hinder the teacher's performance, momentarily boosting his own confidence. However, the teacher then remarked, You're too weak, infuriating Jogo, who then unleashed a deadly move. The ground around them enclosed Yuji and the others, with hot magma erupting from the fractured rocks. Facing a perplexed Yuji, the teacher began to explain that opening a domain requires a significant amount of cursed energy, which is one of the benefits as it enhances strength. The most terrifying aspect is that attacks within a domain are guaranteed to hit. There are two ways to counter this. One is to escape the domain, and the other is to expand your own domain. Jogo initiated an attack, and as a wave of hot rocks nearly hit them, they suddenly stopped because the teacher had powered up, causing another frenzy among the fans. Jogo found himself surrounded by a barrier, confused and panicking as his brain was flooded with useless information. Then, he was pulled into a limitless inner side where he could see and feel everything but could do nothing, like a lamb ready for slaughter. It was an unsolvable mental control skill. After finishing speaking, he beheaded Jogo in one move. After releasing the domain, Jogo's head had already fallen to the ground. Then, he stepped on Jogo's head and asked him who had given the orders. Meanwhile, in the distance, the long-haired man and his group were watching the battle. Seeing Jogo about to perish, Hanami decided to intervene. Suddenly, a bunch of flowers appeared before the teacher, and beautiful fresh flowers instantly sprouted all around. The teacher quickly patted his own face, realizing it was a curse. Yuji was attacked during this distraction, and Hanami rescued Jogo. But the teacher did not chase them immediately. Instead, he chose to save Yuji, who was almost devoured by a tree spirit. When the teacher tried to trace their scent, they had already made their escape. After the long-haired man and his group returned to their headquarters, inspired by this battle, they decided to seal Gojo Satoru in Shibuya in a few weeks. On the other side, Megumi and the others were training when they met a senior from another school. He was Aoi, and beside him was Mai, who is Maki's twin sister. 
The third year Aoi wanted to test their strength, so he tore off his shirt and prepared for battle, striking Megumi immediately. Meanwhile, Nobara was embraced by her senior, who then pulled out a gun, threatening her not to move. On the other side, Megumi, facing the monstrous Aoi, summoned five frogs to fight. But Aoi instantly killed them with one strike and teleported behind Megumi for a hug, then performed a suplex on him. Megumi was grabbed by Aoi, who then violently smashed his head into a wooden wall. And after a series of charges and blows, Megumi was sent flying. But Aoi's attack did not stop. Suddenly he was bound by three frogs. At this critical moment, Megumi was ready to use his trump card. Togue and Panda Senpai arrived to save the day, with Panda landing a punch on Aoi. Thus, Megumi was saved. And on Nobara's side, the situation was also one-sided. As the older sister, Maki arrived just in time, intending to discipline her younger sister. But Nobara took the opportunity to bind her sister. Just then, Aoi returned. And without deciding a winner, they could only wait until the Jujutsu exchange event to continue. On another note, Yuji was called by the teacher for a mission, and the person accompanying him was a grade one Jujutsu sorcerer. He was an office worker, Nanami Kento. This mission was to investigate three unusual deaths in a cinema. Clearly a case of cursed spirits, as discovered by Nanami after his investigation. As they were about to leave, suddenly a cursed spirit appeared behind them, indicating they were being targeted. Seeing this, the teacher immediately drew his weapon, ready to fight. Facing this special grade cursed spirit, he calmly searched for a killing point, because his technique could forcibly create weaknesses on the enemy. If he could strike the opponent at the critical point of the body's 3-7 ratio, he could hit the vital spot. After explaining, he immediately demonstrated on the spot, his glasses allowing him to see the target's 3.7 ratio, and after confirming the position, he delivered a fierce slash to the cursed spirit. After hitting the critical point, he killed the cursed spirit with a single strike. Meanwhile, Yuji, who was watching the scene, was ambushed, but thanks to his training, he finally had the appearance of Yuji. His hands were filled with cursed energy and his attacks could cause secondary damage. Because his cursed energy couldn't keep up with his burst power, a punch to the cursed spirit caused initial damage, followed by the emergence of cursed energy which then formed the secondary damage. After the cursed spirit was defeated, it was confirmed by a doctor that they were once humans who had been transformed by cursed techniques. Kento also discovered something new. On the day at the cinema, this young man was also present. He is Yoshino Junpei, a high school student. At school, he was often bullied by a few guys. One day, he went to the cinema to watch a movie, and the bullies were also there. Suddenly, Mahito appeared behind them, and after placing his hand on one of their faces, the scene flashed, and those guys had turned into transfigured humans. Upon seeing this, Junpei chased after them to find out what happened. It turned out that Mahito was also a cursed spirit. To ascertain whether Junpei was a human or a cursed spirit, Kento arranged for Yuji to investigate him along with a counselor. Meanwhile, Kento, who had the enemy's hideout details, went alone to check it out. After finishing speaking, Yuji took a small cursed spirit to approach Junpei. Because Junpei was skipping classes, the homeroom teacher came looking for him. At that moment, Junpei tried to use a curse, but suddenly Yuji flew in, and Junpei could see the cursed spirit on Yuji. Thus, Junpei was taken away by Yuji. Faced with Yuji's questioning, he managed to act as if he knew nothing. Helplessly, Yuji had to wait for the higher-ups to handle it. Eventually, they even chatted and went to Junpei's house as guests. Meanwhile, Kento had already arrived at the enemy's hideout. A troublesome guy appeared. He was Mahito, a special grade cursed spirit possessed with intelligence. As expected of a special grade cursed spirit, he could block a slash with his hand. Kento not only possessed rich close combat skills, but was also very skilled with his legs. Then, through his eyes, he saw the 7-3 ratio on Mahito's body, played around with a kitchen knife, and dealt a critical blow to Mahito. Mahito was calm despite being hit because he could self-heal. Then, he brought out human-shaped cursed spirits that he had transformed. His technique could alter objects with souls. At this moment, Kento had no time to listen to his complaints, since he was half an hour from finishing work. Thus, he decided on a quick resolution. The cursed spirits summoned by Mahito were very troublesome. Not only did he have to face attacks from the cursed spirits, but he also had to beware of Mahito's sneak attacks. 
Kento could only dodge while looking for opportunities to strike. After a thick smoke cleared, Kento was unharmed. Suddenly, Mahito flashed in front of him, and using his technique, tried to alter Kento's body. But Kento protected his soul with his cursed energy. At this moment, Mahito became even more troublesome, increasing his movement speed. After covering his arms with cursed energy, he directly lunged at Kento. At this moment, he looked at the time. It was already six o'clock. It was time to get off work. Muttering, it's time to start working overtime. Seeing this, Mahito was stunned on the spot. It turned out that Kento used time to restrain his cursed energy. Now that work was over, the restraint was lifted. At this moment, with his cursed energy fully unleashed, Kento planned to shatter Mahito's body with a single strike. This punch smashed the wall to pieces. When Mahito tried to dodge, Kento slashed his legs, leaving Mahito unable to move and forced to endure the rock attack. After a brief flash on the screen, the long-haired man appeared. At this time, Mahito ran out like a snake, still alive. Kento also suffered a bit from the encounter. On the other side, Yuji was still a guest at Junpei's house. After Yuji left, Junpei's mother, who woke up, saw a finger from a cursed spirit on the table, and the next second, she was attacked by a cursed spirit. At this moment, Mahito arrived at their house and told Junpei that his mother was harmed by some wealthy and idle dirty people who hired sorcerers to curse your mother. After hearing this, Junpei had his answer. The next day, after Yuji heard the news, Kento told him to continue monitoring Junpei. Meanwhile, Mahito had placed a barrier around Junpei's school. The long-haired man, unable to leave traces, departed and left the school matters to Mahito. When Junpei arrived at school, the students were already down, and standing aside was a wealthy, dirty young master. Junpei suspected it was him who placed the cursed spirit's finger at his house. Angry Junpei cursed him, causing black spots to appear on the young master's arm. At this moment, Yuji arrived. It turned out Junpei could use sorcery, which Mahito taught him by interfering with his brain. He summoned a jellyfish Shikigami, which immediately engulfed Yuji. Junpei, intent only on vengeance, urged Yuji not to interfere. But Yuji pulled him back, and after breaking free, the jellyfish blocked Yuji's way, prompting Yuji to deliver a series of punches. Out of desperation, he had to exert more force, and this punch directly blasted Junpei away. When Junpei got up, remembering his departed mother, he was overwhelmed with grief and launched a jellyfish spike at Yuji, which Yuji neutralized. Taking advantage of this moment, Yuji launched a verbal attack, and Junpei had no choice but to explain his reasoning. He believed that his plight and his mother's departure were due to the inherent evil of human nature. After saying this, he launched a jellyfish spike at Yuji, but Yuji did not dodge. At this moment, Junpei was dumbfounded, immediately dispelled the Shikigami, and saw the injured Yuji walking towards him and apologizing. Because Yuji, unaware of the situation, had spoken out of turn. He sympathized with Junpei and invited him to the Sorcery Academy to together seek out the perpetrator. In this way, Junpei gradually calmed down until suddenly Mahito appeared, instantly altering his arm and then slammed Yuji against a wall. Yuji yelled for Junpei to run away quickly, but it was already too late as Mahito's arm was already on his shoulder. The next second, Junpei was about to become a cursed spirit, transformed into a cursed spirit Junpei continued to attack Yuji, but Yuji did not remove him. Instead, he called on Sukuna for help to heal Junpei. However, Sukuna refused. At this moment, a desperate Yuji completely lost his temper and punched Mahito in the face. But it wasn't over yet. Yuji continued in a rage, and Mahito could only dodge Yuji's attacks, for Yuji's attacks could severely damage his soul. The agile Mahito, after dodging all his attacks, immediately changed the shape of his arm and swung it toward Yuji. Then, turning his arm into a drill, he shot it towards Yuji. Seizing this opportunity, Yuji immediately grabbed his arm. Even though Yuji's palm was pierced, he endured the severe pain to pull Mahito down. At this moment, Yuji struck him in the stomach, and Mahito returned several barbs as a counterattack. Then, reaching for Yuji's heart, he tried to summon Sukuna, but this foolish act nearly cost him his life as he touched Sukuna's soul, who only gave him a warning. Next time, he would take Mahito's life. Stunned on the spot, Mahito, while Yuji seized the opportunity, aimed a headbutt at Mahito's head. Suddenly, 
Mahito teleported behind Yuji and struck him. Just then, Kento arrived and blocked Mahito's deadly blow. Kento's strategy was to continuously attack Mahito together, giving Mahito no chance to breathe and then to annihilate him. Mahito, taking the situation seriously, planned to eliminate Kento first, but in a two against one situation, he had no chance. So he jumped into the air and launched a sea urchin attack, which was ineffective. After a burst of smoke, Mahito, in the guise of a child, ran out. His smaller body could dodge attacks, but if Yuji hit him, it would be over. Back in his original form, he summoned human cursed spirits to restrain Yuji. At this point, Yuji couldn't bring himself to harm them, but after the cursed spirits pleading, Yuji decided to end their misery quickly. Meanwhile, Kento was caught by Mahito. At the critical moment, Yuji came to the rescue. This was an excellent opportunity. Mahito was sandwiched between Yuji's punches and Kento's slashes. This time, Mahito felt the sensation of death. At this critical moment, he realized how to open his domain technique. Opening his mouth, he declared, Domain Expansion. Once inside the domain, countless hands emerged. Unfortunately, Kento was within his domain, while Yuji narrowly escaped because Mahito dared not touch Sukuna's soul again. Facing this dire situation, Kento had no strategy left, so he took off his glasses, deciding to leave in a cool manner. Suddenly, the top of the domain was shattered. It turned out that Yuji had arrived. At that moment, the soul of Sukuna was touched again. The cold-hearted Sukuna casually flicked his finger, causing unfortunate Mahito to bleed profusely. At this point, Mahito had no choice but to dissolve the domain. Exhausted from consuming a great deal of cursed energy, he was left with no strategies. Seeing this, Yuji immediately rushed forward to deal damage. Suddenly, Mahito's body swelled up. Yuji clenched his fist, his entire body's cursed energy concentrated into one point, and then he unleashed a direct punch. It turned out to be just a diversion. Mahito quickly took this opportunity to escape, while Kento immediately tried to slap him. But unfortunately, Mahito managed to escape. After this battle, the side of the cursed spirits plan to continue collecting fingers to revive Sukuna, thereby aiming to eradicate humanity and usher in an era of cursed spirits. Meanwhile, the human side prepared to hold a cursed technique exchange event. At this time, Yuji returned and reunited with Megumi and the others after a long time. The principal was not pleased, as Yuji was still alive. He then introduced the competition rules. In this area, the side that subdues more cursed spirits would be the winners. Moreover, both sides could engage in combat during the competition. After the introduction, the senior students from the branch school followed the principal's instructions. He ordered the seniors to take the opportunity during the competition to eliminate Yuji. After that, the competition immediately began. On Yuji's side, they first spotted a cursed spirit spider. Just as they were about to succeed, the prey suddenly died on the spot. It turned out that a battle maniac had arrived. Seeing this, Yuji immediately stepped forward and delivered a knee kick. Taking advantage of this opening, the others continued hunting, while Yuji was responsible for holding off AoE. The two hot-blooded youths thus began their battle. AoE launched the first attack. The powerful impact made it impossible for Yuji to land. Yuji, hit by this move, nearly developed Parkinson's disease. At this moment, Aoi had already reached him and then used his foot to wash Yuji's face. After a series of stomping attacks, Yuji was knocked unconscious. Seeing this, Aoi immediately stopped his hand. Just as he was about to leave, disappointed, Yuji stood up and warned Aoi not to mess up his hairstyle, saying that if it got ugly, he would be single forever. Excited, Aoi asked Yuji what kind of woman he liked. Yuji responded, I guess a tall girl with a big butt. Hearing this, Aoi was like someone under a spell, imagining a scene where he and Yuji were reading an indescribable book together. Aoi went to confess to the girl he liked, but unfortunately, she just gave him a friend zone card. At this point, a dejected Aoi could only squat in the corner and cry. Meanwhile, Yuji, trying to comfort him, took him out for a bowl of ramen and a walk to clear his mind. Under Yuji's comforting, Aoi was deeply moved. When he had calmed down, he was in tears and told Yuji that he was his best friend. Senior sister Maki shot at Yuji several times, but Yuji dodged them. It seems that Yuji's strength is rapidly advancing, even able to dodge a sword draw. 
It looks like it's never ending now. Even a low-end version of Genos has shown up. The opponents were desperate to take Yuji's life. At that moment, Yuji was heavily surrounded by the seniors with no way out. Suddenly, someone clapped their hands, and Yuji instantly switched places. It turned out to be Aoi's technique. Aoi then told them to scram because he wanted to have a proper showdown with Yuji, his close friend. After chasing away the seniors, the romantic battle between the two continued. They exchanged punches and kicks. As true men, they didn't back down from the fight. Suddenly, Yuji stepped back, swung around a tree branch, and aimed a kick at Aoi, which Aoi dodged. Seizing the moment, Yuji struck Aoi from behind with a direct punch. Yuji immediately executed a direct punch, but strangely, Aoi seemed to enjoy it, taking the punch straight on without any harm. In a good mood, Aoi began a one-on-one -on -one tutorial. Their hands collided, yet it resulted in a portrait of close friendship. On the other side, when Megumi and the others noticed that the seniors were after Yuji's life, they rushed to save him but encountered the seniors on the way. Megumi faced off against senior Kamo, Mai against Kasumi, and Nobara also found her opponent. Suddenly, Panda Senpai was shot. It turned out to be a sneak attack by a low-end version of Genos. After falling, Panda quickly got up and punched the attacker. It turned out that Mechamaru was a cursed corpse. His real body was submerged in a solution filled with mechanical devices. Enraged, he was ready for a major fight against Panda. He first switched his arms to sword mode, then rotated his palms, and finally activated his jet accelerators. In an instant, he flashed in front of Panda and delivered a fatal blow. After a puff of smoke, his attack was dodged by the agile Panda. Mechamaru had no choice but to use a wide-range attack, with a massive amount of heat erupting from his palms. Panda immediately used cursed energy to protect himself, and surprisingly, he was unharmed. Now it was Panda's turn to counterattack. Panda swung a barrage of punches like a machine gun at Mechamaru's head, followed by a butt strike. After being blown away, Mechamaru began using his unique technique, spewing hot flames from his mouth. The power of this move would affect Nobara's side, so Panda had to block this attack head-on. He fired, and a mushroom cloud erupted. When Mechamaru thought Panda had been utterly destroyed, Panda was still alive and even switched forms. As Mechamaru saw him running towards him, he immediately switched his arm mode to combat. However, Panda's palm destroyed it. At this moment, Mechamaru realized the terrifying aspect of Panda's shocking palm, which could cause internal damage. If it hit the chest or head, Mechamaru would immediately lose the ability to move. Facing the ferocious attack from Panda, he could only dodge while looking for a chance to strike. Mechamaru lured Panda into the air and then directly used the burning flame palm. But the attack was ineffective. After landing, Mechamaru, while fleeing, picked up a tile from the ground. As Panda caught up, he smashed the tile towards Panda's head. With his vision blocked, Mechamaru used this opportunity to activate his jet accelerators and flashed behind Panda, delivering a burning palm strike to a critical spot. Panda was hit and lost consciousness on the spot. Just when Mechamaru thought it was over, Panda grabbed his arm, slapped him across the face, and then forcefully broke his arm. At this point, Mechamaru had completely lost the ability to move. On another front, Maki was battling Kasumi. Maki's strength was incredibly formidable. She was merely an ordinary person without cursed energy, yet she hung Kasumi out to dry. Her mastery with weapons showed a mentor's grace, and her legwork was also impressive, kicking Kasumi straight into a river. Following up with another direct strike, Kasumi, now serious, dodged. She wanted to use a domain attack for a decisive strike. But Maki, unorthodox as ever, did not enter her domain, instead breaking her weapon and throwing it at Kasumi. After blocking the attack, and while Kasumi was intercepting, Maki had already reached her front. After a tussle, Kasumi's knife was now in Maki's hands. Weaponless, Kasumi had no choice but to abandon the fight. Meanwhile, Nobara was battling Momo. Suddenly, Momo attacked Nobara with a broom, the powerful wind rendering Nobara immobile. Taking advantage of this, Momo's broom appeared behind her and then smashed hard into Nobara's face. An angered Nobara retaliated, hammering three nails at Momo. Not only did she miss, but she also faced a dust storm. Against the agile Momo, Nobara was merely struggling in vain, as her nails couldn't hit the target, all three nails striking a tree. However, this had an unexpected effect. 
triggering a secondary attack. Now, the nails emitted strong cursed energy, causing a series of area explosions. Momo could only flee in panic. Just then, Nobara stepped on a nail, grabbed Momo with one hand, unfortunately missing, but her goal was to grab the broomstick. She then inserted the broomstick into a scarecrow and hammered down hard. At this, Momo immediately fell. Seeing this, Nobara quickly pulled out a toy hammer and smashed Momo's face hard. As Nobara was about to continue, suddenly someone fired a shot in the dark. It turned out to be Mai. Nobara was immediately blown away. Mai had come. The shot left Nobara unconscious on the ground. At that moment, her sister Maki arrived. Mai, without a second word, fired directly at her sister. But the powerful sister cut the bullet in half with a knife. Then, through agile movements, she dodged her sister's gunfire. As her sister was still searching for her position, suddenly a branch was cut down. At that moment, the sister was falling, and the elder sister immediately approached to deliver a kick. The younger sister continued to shoot at her elder sister, thinking there was only one bullet left. The elder sister charged directly towards her and cut off the last bullet. It turned out, the younger sister had one last bullet left. In a critical moment, the elder sister caught the bullet with her hand. At this point, the younger sister, having no other options, could only struggle in desperation. Finally, the older sister used the back of her knife to strike at her younger sister's neck. Having lost her handgun, the younger sister was now like a lamb waiting for slaughter. Meanwhile, Megumi was also engaged in fierce combat. Facing several incoming arrows, he only needed to stylishly tilt his head back to evade the attacks. He was the first-year student, Megumi. At this moment, he was in a fierce battle with Senior Kamo. The arrows shot out unexpectedly curved and even seemed to have a guidance system, but all were intercepted by Megumi. Suddenly, the senior shot an arrow through the ceiling. While Megumi was defending, the senior flashed in front of him and delivered a punch. As an archer, his close combat skills should not be underestimated. At this time, the senior activated his Sharingan, instantly teleporting next to Megumi to deliver a palm strike. It turned out that the senior's technique was to manipulate blood, even controlling the composition of his own blood to have the effects of a stimulant. During their battle, the cursed spirits began to make their move. Senior Togue sensed a strong spiritual pressure. It was Hanami who had broken in. It seemed their actions were well prepared. The battle between Megumi and his opponent was still undecided, with their close combat abilities evenly matched. To quickly resolve the fight, Megumi summoned a new Shikigami and immediately launched a water-based attack at the senior. The powerful water pressure instantly flushed Senior Kamo outside. But that was not the end. Megumi summoned a large bird and charged fiercely at the senior. At this time, the senior had not yet lost his ability to act and immediately launched the red blood manipulation technique in retaliation. The stricken bird was bound by blood and immediately fell to the ground. Suddenly, after a loud noise, a gigantic creature appeared. These branch-like beings even extended themselves. Seeing Megumi and the others, Toje immediately used his curse technique to command them to run and dodge the attack. At this moment, a new enemy appeared. After he hammered a large nail into the ground and chanted a curse, a barrier suddenly appeared in the sky. When Gojo Satoru teacher tried to enter, he was immediately repelled, while other teachers could enter freely. It turned out that this barrier was specifically meant to target only Gojo Satoru teacher. To quickly rescue the students, Iori Utahime and the principal went in, while Gojo Satoru teacher thought of ways to break the barrier. The situation was very bad on Megumi's side. Suddenly, the main entrance was blown to smithereens. After a thick smoke cleared, it turned out Hanami had arrived and was blocking their way. At this moment, Megumi immediately tried to call Gojo Satoru teacher, but was interrupted by Hanami. Taking advantage of this moment when Hanami was forced to remain immobile, he suddenly could not move. Then, Senior Kamo launched the red blood manipulation technique, but the damage was merely like scratching an itch. Then it was the large bird's turn to attack, followed by a strike with a knife, but it couldn't cut through the tough body. Now in a bad situation, it was Hanami's turn to exert power. The astonishing aura made Megumi and the others feel uneasy and fearful, forcing them to hide inside the house. Facing Hanami's attacks, Toge was responsible for blocking them with his voice. The senior continued to launch the red blood manipulation technique, 
and this time, it was effective when it hit the head. After striking, they ran and prepared to continue their coordinated attack outside. When Megumi ordered the large bird to attack, Toj could no longer speak. The large bird was severely let down by its teammates. Subsequently, the senior was blown away by a punch. When everyone was at a loss, Toj, despite being hesitant, continued to advance and launch his verbal attack, shouting, Get lost! He himself spat out blood, but Hanami remained completely unharmed. Suddenly Maki arrived, but her sword was broken. Megumi immediately stepped forward and slashed at the branches around Hanami's eyes, but such a special grade-cursed spirit could heal itself. Maki then pulled out a special grade-cursed weapon, the nunchaku, and after a few swings, she struck Hanami with them. This astonishing impact sent Hanami flying hundreds of meters away. Megumi and his group took advantage of the momentum to pursue, summoning a black dog that lunged at Hanami, tore off a piece of flesh. At this moment, Megumi and Maki also rushed over and launched a combined attack on Hanami. Megumi was careless and was infected by Hanami's cursed seed. Once the curse master activated their power, the roots of the cursed seed would dig deeper. At this point, Maki had no choice but to confront Hanami directly, only to be punched and captured. The unyielding Megumi decided to use all his remaining strength to launch a curse technique. Suddenly, Maki told Megumi to stop. Just then, a loud noise erupted as Yuji and Aoi arrived, and Panda came as well. Aoi instructed Panda to take Maki and Megumi away because their showtime was about to begin. Seizing the moment, he unleashed a new move, Black Flash, which directly dismembered one of Hanami's arms. However, this minor injury was negligible to Hanami, who then started to get serious. Without another word, Hanami launched an attack at Yuji and his group. This series of tracking attacks were skillfully dodged by the Agile brothers, who kept charging towards Hanami. They then delivered a synchronized strike, which proved very effective. As Yuji was preparing for another coordinated attack, suddenly Hanami released his wood release technique. However, through their coordinated efforts, they dodged Hanami's lethal strike. When they landed, Yuji hadn't yet recovered when Hanami caught up. Yuji continued to throw punches and kicks, and Aoi followed up with a kick. Without attacks like Black Flash, they couldn't defeat this special grade cursed spirit. Suddenly, Hanami launched a flower attack. Roots instantly appeared under Yuji's feet. Seeing this, Aoi prepared to launch a technique. First, he used his 530,000 IQ brain to analyze all of Hanami's attacks. Then using his CPU-like brain, he concluded that victory was within reach. With renewed confidence, he moved forward to attack, but tripped, and was violently thrown towards the spikes. It seemed like Aoi was doomed, but it turned out that Hanami was the one who was trapped. It appeared that Aoi's technique involved swapping places. The brothers then launched a fierce assault, moving swiftly to Hanami's side and delivering powerful punches. At that moment, Hanami had nowhere to escape. Aoi wore a soul-stirring, hand-clapping expression, indicating he was seriously engaged. Just then, Yuji powered up again, managing to unleash another Black Flash attack. This was not the end. He delivered a quadruple strike. Terrifyingly, Hanami had not yet fallen. At this moment, he launched a cursed seed attack, with such a vast number that it was impossible to dodge. Yuji, who narrowly avoided an attack, suddenly switched places. It turned out that Aoi had taken the hit to protect Yuji. When he tried to protect himself with cursed energy, in just 0.1 seconds, his mind began to wander wildly. He imagined encountering his crush in the classroom who told him that after Megumi was attacked by the cursed seed, the seed seemed to have grown a bit. Aoi realized something was amiss, believing that the cursed seed might not be absorbing blood. After some analysis, he concluded, it was probably absorbing the cursed energy of the host. Just in the nick of time, he released his cursed energy protection. Thus, Aoi dodged a fatal blow and still managed to look defiant. Then, Aoi cornered Hanami near a river, where there was a special grade cursed tool. With the cursed tool, his power was greatly enhanced. After a few swings with the nunchaku, he struck Hanami's face hard. Hanami spat out blood and retaliated against Aoi. At that moment, Aoi was incredulous, because that strike was his full power. Suddenly, Hanami began absorbing the life force of the surrounding plants and converting it into cursed energy. At this moment, 
the flowers opened their eyes, ready to launch a major attack to end the battle. Just as he was about to launch a domain attack, suddenly, the barrier was broken. It turned out that Gojo Satoru had arrived. On the other side, seeing Gojo, the bald-headed principal decided to challenge him one-on-one -on -one and told Yori Utahime to leave. The principal then pulled out a guitar and played a tune for the bald man. This wide-range cursed energy attack directly repelled the bald man. At this time, the bald man had not realized that the barrier was broken. Meanwhile, Gojo Satoru watched everything from above, while Hanami, frightened, hurriedly looked for a place to escape. Seeing that Yuji was safe, Gojo then flashed to where the bald man was and could have killed him with a glance. But fortunately, the principal intervened in time because they still needed to gather information. At that moment, the teacher prepared to support Yuji and the others. Under the teacher's command, two techniques collided, creating a devastating force that leveled the forest. At this moment, Hanami immediately went into defensive mode to save his life. After the attack dissipated, the ground formed a vast abyss. When the teacher thought it was over, Mahito from the cursed spirit's side had already infiltrated inside and successfully retrieved Sukuna's fingers. It turned out this was their real intention. But as bait, Hanami suffered. Losing half of his body, he barely escaped back to the base and was almost killed by his crazed companions. Fortunately, Mahito intervened in time. Right after they retrieved Sukuna's fingers, they immediately started causing trouble. These three beings are special grade cursed spirits and are among the cursed womb, death paintings. Then, they took the captured humans and made them vessels. Those who successfully became vessels were immediately sent to retrieve Sukuna's fingers. After this great battle, the students were healing, thus ending this year's Jujutsu exchange event. The next day, Yuji and the others received a new mission to investigate these three victims, all of whom were killed by cursed spirits. Moreover, they all attended the same school. Just like that, Yuji and his friends went to the school to find out what was going on. As soon as they entered the school, they encountered three exemplary students. When they saw Megumi, they were so frightened that they immediately bowed deeply. It turned out that Megumi was famously known as a fighter in the past. After some questioning, they learned that the cause of the victim's deaths was related to the 88 Bridge, a notorious suicide spot. So, they decided to go and explore the bridge. The three of them crouched there till dawn, but nothing happened. As they were about to retreat, suddenly, the exemplary students brought their sister along and told them to enter from under the bridge in the middle of the night. After wandering around under the bridge, they indeed sensed the presence of a cursed spirit. Then, a special grade cursed spirit appeared, one of the nine phases, named Keichizu. Seeing this, Yuji couldn't wait and went up to remove it. First, he kicked its head, then followed up with a series of punches to the face, punching until it spat out a mouthful of old blood. Suddenly, Yuji was grabbed by the arm, but with a quick spin, he kicked the cursed spirit's buttocks. Nobara, meanwhile, was playing whack-a-mole, throwing nails and hammering hard as she faced a multitude of attacking moles. Megumi, on his side, took down a mole with each slice. Nobara was dragged out, but undaunted, she told Megumi to continue fighting the moles. At this point, Kachizu also ran out, and Yuji had to chase after it to rescue Nobara, while Megumi was responsible for eliminating all the cursed spirits in the area. With such fluid operations, it didn't take long to completely clear out all the moles. Then, a four-eyed cursed spirit appeared, looking exactly like the one from the juvenile detention center, but this one was stronger. It broke Megumi's sword with one move, then flashed behind him and punched him in the head. That punch made Megumi remember what his teacher said. The teacher had told him to be more confident and to fight more fiercely. Suddenly, Megumi unlocked his energy channels. Awakened, he decided to go completely wild. After partially opening his domain, the surroundings turned pitch black. While the cursed spirit was still confused, Megumi told him the name of his domain. When it tried to break free, Megumi immediately executed a jaw-crushing kick. At this time, a large bird joined the battle, rushing and crashing around, which completely infuriated the special grade cursed spirit. Then, it launched an energy wave to eliminate all attacks, even erasing the partial domain. Caught off guard, it was instantly killed by the black dog. As long as Megumi went wild with his strength, defeating a special grade cursed spirit was no problem. 
they successfully retrieved Sukuna's fingers in the end. Meanwhile, Nobara was still fighting. It turned out she was captured by a bald-headed man, also one of the special grade cursed spirits from the Nine Phases. He warned Nobara not to look at his back, but Yuji came running out and saw his back thoroughly. Angered, the bald-headed man got serious, his back spraying out a large amount of paint, then rushing towards Yuji and the others. Seeing this, Yuji had no choice but to give Nobara a princess carry. This astonishing sprinting acceleration allowed them to quickly escape the danger zone. Suddenly, Kachizu sprayed a mouthful of paint at Yuji, and Nobara was hit as well. It turned out that the paint was their technique, and those hit by it would be corroded by the paint. The only way to break the technique was to hit the enemy. Just when they thought they were about to win, Nobara pulled out a nail and drove it hard into her own hand. The brothers instantly felt excruciating pain. At that moment, Yuji unleashed a ground-shaking punch, and the bald man was immediately dazed. The poison had no effect on Yuji because the entity inside him was the king of poisons. At this point, Kechizu was beaten helplessly, and with Nobara's technique attack, the brothers were at a loss. Suddenly, Yuji changed positions, and at the same time, they both used a powerful move. The bald man lost an arm and Kichizu was down on the ground. Suddenly, using his last strength, he lunged at Nobara. At that moment, Nobara snapped her fingers, and Kichizu was instantly finished. Suddenly, a car drove by. The bald man got on and took a hostage from the car. As Yuji chased after him, Nobara had already used a master stroke on the bald man's arm, causing him to fall on the spot. Taking advantage of this gap, Yuji once again used a black flash. After the battle, they found Megumi. Megumi asked Yuji to keep the fingers, but they were accidentally eaten by Sukuna's little mouth. Just like that, in the first season, Yuji had eaten a total of four fingers. Meanwhile, on the side of the cursed spirits, they continued to plot their grand plans. And Gojo Satoru Sensei invited a beautiful teacher to investigate the traitor within the school. Finally, on the recommendation of the beautiful teacher and Aoi, Maki, Panda, Megumi, Nobara, and Yuji were recommended to become grade one jujutsu sorcerers. Do you know the taste of a cursed spirit? It's like a mop that has wiped the floor. Yet this man still insisted on swallowing the cursed spirit to help everyone. In this video, we not only witnessed the birth of the invincible Gojo Satoru, but also saw how Ghetto Suguru turned dark during the mission. In the complex and intertwined Shibuya incident, no one could remain uninvolved, not even Gojo Satoru. The story begins in a castle where Mei Mei and Yori Utahime were ordered to carry out a mission. After a simple search of the rooms, the two unwittingly fell into a cursed spirit's looping barrier. They tried to create a breach by varying their running speeds, but just then, the entire castle began to collapse. It turned out that Gojo Satoru and others had arrived. Yori Utahime was trapped under a rock, and Gojo Satoru, seeing this, began to mock her. Yori Utahime became furious upon hearing this. Just as she was about to react, a cursed spirit suddenly appeared behind her. Don't swallow it. Let me absorb it a bit more. Gato Suguru's cursed spirit instantly devoured it. The group successfully completed the mission, but then they suddenly realized that they had not lowered the curtain during the mission. This would inevitably impact the outside world. Yaga was very angry when he learned of this and soon punished the three on the spot. At that time, Gojo Satoru was very rebellious, but Geto Suguru was a very kind high school student. He always adhered to the principle that sorcerers should protect non-sorcerers. The two often fought over this. Just then, Yaga arrived there, and he received a new mission, which was to protect Lord Tengen's new body. Although Tengen possesses an immortality technique, he is not ageless. If a suitable new host is not found at the right time, Lord Tengen will evolve into a higher realm, and at that time, his consciousness will no longer exist. All of the sorcery barriers at Jujutsu High would be affected. Therefore, every 500 years, Lord Tengen must assimilate with a human compatible with his star plasma body. As long as the body is rejuvenated, all barriers will also be reset. So now, the task of Gojo Satoru and Geto Suguru is to protect that star plasma body girl. The main enemies trying to kill her now are two factions, the Curse Group and the Pan Star Cult. In Lord Tengen's eyes, only Gojo Satoru and Geto Suguru are capable of this mission. Then the two came to the girl's residence, and the moment Geto Suguru pressed the doorbell, 
a bomb inside exploded. The girl flew directly out of the window. The curse group thought the girl was doomed, but just then, they suddenly saw Geto Suguru had already rescued the target. On the other side, Gojo Satoru was still on the phone, but just then, countless steel knives flew towards him. Bairu had long heard of Gojo Satoru's terror, and today he just wanted to test it. Gojo Satoru made a harsh statement, as long as you apologize crying, I will spare your life. That's the rule. This is a cursed spirit that desperately wants to be loved. Whenever she encounters a man, she crazily demands kisses, leaving the man sweating profusely. Just now, Gojo Satoru and Gedo Suguru successfully rescued the Star Plasma body. The two returned her to the hotel. Just then, Amanai Riko suddenly woke up. One would have thought she would be saddened by becoming a vessel, but Riko's mindset was surprisingly positive. Meanwhile, in an attempt to assassinate Riko, the Pan Star cult offered 30 million to hire Fushiguro Toji. Even though he knew his opponent was the once-in-a-century genius Gojo Satoru, Toji appeared quite confident. He planned to start his operation after the bounty hunters had worn down the opposition. On the other side, Riko quickly returned to school after recovering. However, it was at this moment that the cursed spirit sent by Geto Suguru to monitor the situation was suddenly removed. The trio hurried to the school. As Geto Suguru ran into a corridor, an old man suddenly blocked his path. This man possessed the same type of sorcery as Geto Suguru. In just a few seconds, the old man came up with a thousand combat strategies. Just as he was about to implement his plan, Geto Suguru released a massive cursed spirit. The initial smaller spirits were to distract him, weren't they? The old man was instantly engulfed. Geto Suguru thought the battle was over, but the next moment, the old man suddenly jumped in through a window. Then, he entered the illusionary realm set by Geto Suguru. By the time the old man realized this, Geto Suguru had already knocked him unconscious. On the other side, Riko was still in class at a church. However, just then, Gojo Satoru suddenly burst in. Everyone was baffled at first, but in the next moment, all the female students were mesmerized by his stunning beauty. Even the teacher was subdued by Gojo Satoru's charm. The duo took advantage of the chaos to slip out of the school. Geto Suguru also learned that Amanai Riko had been put up for a bounty by the Pan Star cult, so he quickly called Gojo Satoru. By this time, the two were already surrounded by bounty hunters. Riko initially thought this was a kind of shikigami technique, but Gojo Satoru immediately recognized it as a cloning technique. The user could switch their real body among the clones, making it easy to launch a sneak attack. Even so, Gojo Satoru didn't take his opponent seriously. The man was shocked to hear this and realized he was no match for Gojo Satoru. Just as he was about to turn and run, Gojo Satoru suddenly shattered the glass in front of him. The man was hiding behind the glass. Gojo Satoru formed a hand seal with one hand and initiated a technique reversal. As the man braced for death, Gojo Satoru's technique unexpectedly failed. At this moment, he was also puzzled. But just then, Riko's phone suddenly received a message. Misato had been kidnapped. The supposedly invincible Gojo Satoru had been brutally killed by the tyrannical Fushiguro Toji. The two had met once when Gojo Satoru was young, and that was the only time Toji had been discovered in the shadows. Just recently, Gojo Satoru and others had successfully rescued Amanai Riko. But at that moment, Misato was kidnapped by the Pan Star cult. It was expected to be a difficult rescue, but the trio quickly managed to save her. Led by Gojo Satoru, everyone then went to a seaside location. They wanted Riko to enjoy life before being assimilated. Gojo Satoru, in order to ensure the safety of the Star Plasma vessel, stayed awake for two days and nights. After everyone returned to the Jujutsu High School, Gojo Satoru finally relaxed his tense nerves. Just as they were about to deliver Riko to Tengen, Gojo Satoru's chest was suddenly pierced by a blade. Everyone stood frozen in shock at the scene. The assailant was Fushiguro Toji, sent by the Pan Star Cult. After a long period of waiting and wearing down his opponent, Toji had finally seized the moment when Gojo Satoru was off guard. Gojo Satoru quickly created distance between himself and his attacker, while Geto Suguru seized the opportunity to summon a cursed spirit to devour him. Although Toji caught him off guard, Gojo Satoru was not seriously harmed. He instructed Geto Suguru to take Amanai Riko away from the area first. 
a fierce exchange of blows quickly ensued. Gojo Satoru initiated a powerful technique right away. Toji, attempting to close in at high speed, was unexpectedly repelled by Gojo Satoru's technique. The fight moved into a residential area where Toji's speed increased once again. Gojo Satoru could not detect any cursed energy on him, so he used a curse technique to destroy the entire area, preventing Toji from launching a surprise attack. At that moment, a swarm of cursed spirits emerged from the forest, surrounding Gojo Satoru and obscuring Toji's location. Just when Gojo Satoru thought Toji was targeting Riko, Toji appeared suddenly from the side. Before Gojo Satoru could react, Toji's cursed tool was already plunged into him. Gojo Satoru was completely incapacitated, and thus the invincible Gojo Satoru was easily taken down by Fushiguro Toji. Meanwhile, Geto Suguru, with Amanai Riko, reached the Hoshiomiya, the main barrier of Jujutsu High. As long as Riko reached the base of the Great Tree, she could wait for Tengen's assimilation. However, at that moment, Geto Suguru suggested that Riko could also choose to leave emphasizing that everyone has the right to choose their own life path. Hearing this, Riko burst into tears, not wanting to lose her current life. Just as Riko was about to leave with Geto Suguru, a gunshot suddenly shattered the peace, and Riko fell to the ground. Geto Suguru was stunned, and just then, Fushiguro Toji appeared from the corridor. Upon hearing of Gojo Satoru's death, Geto Suguru was enraged and summoned a special, grade-cursed spirit, its terrifying power dragging Fushiguro Toji directly into the barrier. Just then, the two men's cursed spirits suddenly vanished. Geto Suguru had not expected that the opponent would know the entrance to the Hoshiomiya, as he had left no trace. However, at that moment, Toji stated that he could pinpoint a person's location using just his senses. Geto Suguru then launched another attack, and the Rainbow Dragon charged at Toji, causing massive destruction in the Hoshiomiya. Yet, these cursed spirits still could not inflict any damage. Toji effortlessly leapt into the air and with a single slash, split the Rainbow Dragon in two. Seeing this, Geto Suguru was shaken, realizing that even the incredibly tough Rainbow Dragon could not withstand his cursed tool. As the section of the bridge they were on began to collapse, suddenly, a phantom wraith appeared behind Toji. It was Geto Suguru's special grade cursed spirit, Split Mouth Woman. By posing a question, she created a simple domain. Toji quickly understood the principle behind it and was about to answer when the Split Mouth Woman instantly cut off Toji's hair. But in the next instant, Fushiguro Toji shattered the simple domain. Seeing this, Geto Suguru attempted to take advantage of the situation to control his cursed spirit. However, Fushiguro Toji instantly interrupted his casting. Immediately after, Toji switched to a new cursed tool and used it on Geto Suguru. At this moment, the bridge had completely collapsed and Geto Suguru had already lost consciousness. Then, Toji took the Star Plasma Vessel to the Pan Star Cult. After the leader confirmed everything, he directly paid the bounty. They would never allow Lord Tengen to assimilate with humans. Only by transcending humanity could the Pan Star Cult ascend. Soon after, Toji left the place. Just as he was about to go out for a hearty meal, Gojo Satoru appeared before him again. Toji was shocked to see him. It turned out that Gojo Satoru had mastered the core of cursed energy in his dying moments, which allowed him to use a reverse curse technique to resurrect himself. The confrontation between the two began immediately. Toji launched the first attack, thinking his strike would hit. But just then, Gojo Satoru suddenly appeared behind him. With a sound, a terrifying burst of cursed energy sent Toji flying. This was the power of the reverse curse technique. Seeing this, Toji had no choice but to use all his strength. He pulled a new cursed tool from the mouth of his curse spirit and immediately flung it at Gojo Satoru. But even though Gojo Satoru was stepping on thin air, he easily dodged it. At this moment, he seemed to be in a realm of his own. Although the Xenon family is very knowledgeable about limitless cursed techniques, the move Gojo Satoru used next was known by very few within the Gojo family. He formed a single hand seal, and in the next moment, a terrifying cursed energy gathered in his hand. As the technique approached him, Toji sensed the danger. Ultimately, the result was clear. Toji's body was completely destroyed. Gojo Satoru asked him if he had any last words, but Toji mentioned that there was a child he couldn't let go of. 
the boy was chatting happily with him one second, and the next, he was mercilessly killed by a cursed spirit. Geto Suguru, looking at Hybera's body, felt his anger reach its peak. Since the day the Star Plasma Vessel mission failed, he had been continuously convincing himself. But the events that followed had begun to shake his heart. At this time, Gojo Satoru had completely mastered the use of limitless cursed techniques. With the support of the reverse curse technique, he could maintain the activation of cursed techniques at any time. Gojo Satoru had become a formidable modern cursed technique user. Geto Suguru envied this, but he still silently carried out those unknown exorcisms of cursed spirits. Gradually, his mindset began to change, and the final decision was influenced by the special grade sorcerer, Tsukumo Yuki. This person was very special. Despite being a special grade sorcerer, she never accepted any missions and had ideas completely different from those of the Jujutsu High. She aimed to create a world without cursed spirits, and her methods involved either eliminating all humans' cursed energy or teaching everyone to control cursed energy. After hearing this, Geto Suguru was shocked, but it was Tsukumo Yuki's words that sparked a terrifying idea in his mind. Wouldn't it be simpler just to eliminate all non-sorcerers? Geto Suguru could not judge his own right or wrong, but if the end was a mountain of fallen comrades, he only had to abandon his former ideals. That night, Geto Suguru annihilated everyone in the village, including his own parents. Gojo Satoru was shocked when he learned of this, unable to believe that the gentle Geto Suguru he knew could have transformed into what he was today. However, the reality was that Geto Suguru had set himself on a path of no return. Following this, Geto Suguru approached the Pan Star Cult, aiming to achieve his goals which required a vast amount of curses and money. Taking over the Pan Star Cult was the first step in accomplishing his objectives. Although he expected things to go smoothly, the upper echelon of the cult expressed their opposition. In response, Geto Suguru brought one of the elders onto the stage and, without hesitation, killed him, declaring, just obediently follow me, this is the true idea I have chosen. Thus began Geto Suguru's plan to eradicate all non-sorcerers. Meanwhile, Gojo Satoru found Megumi and told him about killing Toji. But Megumi felt nothing about this revelation, only wishing to live a happy life with his sister. However, the fate of the Xenon family bloodline meant that his life would not be so ordinary. The story then returns to the present, where Gojo Satoru is awakened by Yuji and two others. In that moment, it felt like a dream, but it was all a part of the real experiences of Gojo Satoru. Two and a half years later, Mahito uses his domain expansion again, instantly destroying Mikamaru's Mecha. Just then, with the increasing number of special grade curse spirits, Gojo Satoru realizes there is a mole in the Jujutsu High. He assigns Yori Utahimi to handle the situation. After a few days of investigation, Utahimi quickly identifies a suspect and brings Yuji and others in on it. Nobara quickly deduces that the mole is from the Tokyo campus. It was Mekamaru. The group then arrives at the target basement, expecting to find Mekamaru's body there. But upon opening the door, they discover Mekamaru has already left, confirming he is the mole. Simultaneously, Mahito and Kenjaku arrive at Mekamaru's location as their information exchange has concluded, and Mekamaru's payment is the healing of his body by Mahito. Due to a binding vow, Mahito must heal him before he can eliminate him. Mahito slowly approaches Mekamaru, placing his hand on his head, and successfully restores Mekamaru's body. However, Mekamaru does not seem very happy as he now has to face an attack from both men. Mahito initiates a curse, but Mekamaru summons numerous puppets to attack. However, Mahito dismisses them with a wave of his hand. Just as Mahito thinks the battle is over, the ground suddenly breaks apart, and a massive mecha, Mekamaru's ultimate form Zero, emerges from underwater. Excited, Mahito guesses that Mekamaru's real body is inside, and now, Mekamaru needs to urgently contact Gojo Satoru to potentially win this battle. First, he must eliminate Mahito. Mekamaru raises the mecha's arm and fires a powerful light cannon charged with a year's worth of cursed energy directly at Mahito a blast of special grade curse power that instantly destroys the dam, leaving Mahito with only facial burns. Mekamaru continued his attacks, but Mahito effortlessly dodged them all. Mekamaru realized that while his mecha's attacks could damage Mahito's physical body, they couldn't touch his soul. 
At that moment, he infused a special jutsu spell into the mecha. As Mahito was still in mid-air, Mechamaru shot him directly. Mahito thought it was just a typical attack, but in the next moment, his soul was suddenly shattered. The mecha then kicked Mahito away, and before he could react, Mechamaru delivered another kick to Mahito's real body, rendering him powerless to fight back. Seeing this, Mechamaru pressed his advantage, unleashing countless light cannons from inside the mecha. Mahito desperately tried to escape by constantly changing his form. At that moment, he still had two jutsu-filled bullets. Just as Mechamaru was about to launch a full-scale attack, Mahito suddenly activated his domain expansion, enveloping Mechamaru completely within it. The mecha lost power, but just as Mahito was about to turn and leave, the mecha behind him suddenly lit up again, and Mahito's body was instantly pierced. It turned out that Mechamaru had activated a simplified domain in those brief two and a half minutes. Inside the domain, all jutsu were guaranteed to hit, which is why Mahito's body was damaged. Now, Mechamaru shifted his target to Kenjaku. Just as he was preparing to attack, Mahito suddenly charged into the Mecha. At this point, Mechamaru had only one last curse technique and puppet left, but clearly they were no match for Mahito. After a brief battle, Mechamaru was defeated. The sky darkened with a black veil, countless people were swallowed by darkness, and the Shibuya incident in Tokyo officially began. Three special-grade sorcerers mobilized to corner Gojo Satoru. But even so, Gojo Satoru did not take them seriously. Just moments ago, the entire Shibuya district was completely enveloped by this veil, trapping all citizens in a subway station. Upon hearing the news, Gojo Satoru hurried to the scene. But he discovered that the scale of this veil was not something ordinary people could achieve. Then, the Jujutsu High dispatched all its sorcerers to the location. The team was divided into squads and stood by for orders. However, as Yuji and Mei Mei were preparing to head to the scene, another veil identical to Shibuya's descended on another Tokyo station. The two quickly arrived at another station, where two support staff had already been defeated, and there were several modified humans between the veils. Yuji now faced two choices exercise a powerful curse spirit or kill the weaker modified humans. After hearing this, Yuji fell silent, but Mei Mei quickly made the decision for him, knowing that Yuji couldn't face the modified humans. After planning their strategy, the two began their operation. When Yuji reached the second basement level, the scene before him left him stunned. A curse spirit resembling a locust was devouring humans. Yuji did not attack immediately. After a brief exchange, he learned that Mahito was maintaining the veil on the lower floor. Yuji then decided to first destroy the veil here. He swung a powerful punch at the curse spirit's body, the force breaking through the wall. The curse spirit then lunged at Yuji with astonishing bouncing power and biting force, shocking Yuji. Even so, he was confident that he could defeat the curse spirit in front of him. The locust began to spread its wings, and in the next moment, it lunged at Yuji. What seemed like ordinary attacks were actually immensely powerful, yet the cursed spirit still couldn't hit Yuji. Then, both parties ceased their attacks. Yuji walked up to the cursed spirit, and they began to confront each other with their fists. The locust thought its four arms would surely overpower the opponent, but in just two and a half minutes, Yuji completely defeated it. Next, the locust tried to launch a sneak attack with its abdomen, but in the next moment, Yuji swiftly dodged and then broke the locust's abdomen with a punch. Mahito's first veil was completely lifted. Meanwhile, Gojo Satoru was being held up by Jogo and Hanami. Due to the presence of non-sorcerers, Gojo Satoru couldn't use domain expansion. Jogo and the others thought to use the civilians nearby to threaten him, but Gojo Satoru didn't fall for it. He knew that to resolve this incident, some sacrifices were inevitable. Then, the three launched an attack on Gojo Satoru simultaneously but he was not perturbed at all. He thought that their attacks couldn't touch him, but at that moment, Jogo and Hanami used a new technique. At the critical moment, Gojo Satoru successfully escaped the battlefield. It turns out the opposition used a simplified domain to envelop him. Although the guaranteed hit effect was reduced, it was precisely because of this that they could hit Gojo Satoru. Jogo finally saw a chance to defeat Gojo Satoru and began to taunt him. However, at that moment, Gojo Satoru still didn't take his opponents seriously. Then, an old friend appeared again. The familiar voice made Gojo Satoru freeze in place. 
and numerous memories flashed through his mind. At that moment, he wished that the person standing in front of him was Gato Suguru, but his rational mind pulled Gojo Satoru back to reality. Facing the attack of two special grade curses, Gojo Satoru was completely at ease. He had now fully unleashed his limitless curses. Jogo and Hanami were no match for him. Then, at that moment, Gojo Satoru tore off Jogo's arm. Seeing this, Hanami wanted to deactivate the domain expansion, but Jogo quickly stopped him. Before Hanami could react, Gojo Satoru was already in front of him and promptly pulled out both of Hanami's horns. Seeing this, Jogo felt terrified. But at that moment, he and Hanami launched another sneak attack on Gojo Satoru. They thought this time the domain expansion would neutralize his techniques. But Gojo Satoru simply stopped pretending. He turned around and walked towards Hanami. His terrifying limitless curse technique pinned the opponent against the wall. Jogo tried to create a diversion by attacking from the side. But in the next moment, the special grade curse spirit Hanami was forcefully eradicated by Gojo Satoru. Seeing this, Jogo hurriedly ran into the crowd. Choso also took the opportunity to launch a sneak attack, but it had no effect on Gojo Satoru. At this moment, Kenjaku still didn't want to use the domain because, in his view, Gojo Satoru's energy had hardly been depleted. Just then, Mahito arrived with a truckload of modified humans. Upon hearing this, Gojo Satoru immediately sensed trouble. Sure enough, as soon as the train doors opened, a large number of cursed spirits surged out from inside the train and began to wreak havoc on humanity. Choso and Mahito also joined in, and at this moment, Gojo Satoru was faced with an unprecedented choice to let the cursed spirits go and first eliminate Jogo and the others, or to open his domain and annihilate everyone together. Just as Jogo and the others thought Gojo Satoru would choose the former, a voice rang out, Unlimited Void. Gojo Satoru's domain instantly expanded, and everyone was caught in a state of complete stillness. This time, Gojo Satoru had to exercise all the cursed spirits within 0.2 seconds, as this was the limit that non-sorcerers could withstand within the domain. Gojo Satoru frantically moved through the crowd, quickly resolving all the modified humans. At this moment, Gojo Satoru's energy was significantly depleted, and just as he was catching his breath, the sight of a special grade cursed tool stopped him in his tracks. Suddenly, the domain expansion opened, and Gojo Satoru, intending to turn and leave, was taken aback as Kenjaku suddenly appeared behind him. Numerous memories flashed through Gojo Satoru's mind, but in the next moment, the domain expansion suddenly locked his body, rendering him unable to use his cursed energy. Kenjaku, intending to impersonate Gedo Suguru and deceive him, was instantly seen through by Gojo Satoru, who knew that as long as he transferred his brain, he could continuously replace his physical body. Soon, the seal on Gedo Suguru would be broken, and Kenjaku's main goal was to obtain his curse manipulation technique. Gojo Satoru's sealing plunged everyone into a desperate situation. Meanwhile, Yuji suddenly received a message from Mekamaru, a cursed speech left before his death. Gojo Satoru has been sealed. Can humans survive after their brains are replaced? The answer is yes. Kenjaku, occupying Gedo Suguru's body, successfully locked Gojo Satoru using the domain expansion. Just as he was about to complete the sealing, a single sentence from Gojo Satoru awakened the body of Gedo Suguru. <laughs> Kenjaku was initially shocked, but soon he laughed. It was unexpected that Gato Suguru's body still harbored his will. Kenjaku controlled his right hand and in the next moment, completely sealed Gojo Satoru. After completing the seal, the biggest threat of this operation was neutralized. Just as Kenjaku and the others were preparing to leave, the domain expansion tool suddenly fell to the ground. Everyone was shocked. What a monster! It seems that physical time has not flowed. On the other side, Yuji and Mei Mei received the news of Gojo Satoru's sealing. They quickly split up to take action. Mei Mei stayed to resolve the remaining curse spirits while Yuji went out to inform his classmates at the Jujutsu High. Just as he was about to leave the tent, Mekamaru discovered new information. Kenjaku temporarily could not take the domain expansion tool out of here. What Yuji needed to do now was to urgently contact others to surround the area. At this moment, a large number of cursed spirits appeared outside the tent. Yuji did not hesitate and charged out. 
and then all the cursed spirits began to rush towards him. But Yuji resolved them all with just two moves. Yuji climbed up to the rooftop along the balcony and shouted out the news of Gojo Satoru's ceiling to Kento. Hearing this, everyone quickly rushed to Yuji's side, because in Kento's view, if Gojo Satoru was truly sealed, the entire world of Jujutsu would also be doomed. Soon, Megumi and others joined Yuji upon hearing the message from Mekamaru. Kento immediately assigned tasks. Yuji and Megumi were responsible for removing the curtain that prohibited sorcerers from entering, while Kento planned to meet up with Ijichi first. At this moment, he was unaware of the impending danger. While Ijichi was focused on broadcasting information to everyone, Haruta suddenly assassinated him from behind. At the same time, Mahito realized that their actions had been exposed. He intended to leave before the sorcerers arrived, but Choso wanted to kill Yuji to avenge his brother. Jogo was displeased upon hearing this because he wanted to resurrect Sukuna through Yuji. However, Mahito pointed out that Gojo Satoru had been sealed, and their power was now evenly matched with that of Jujutsu High. Reviving Sukuna could pose an even greater threat. Jogo disagreed, and they decided that whoever encountered Yuji first would follow through with their own plan. Just then, Mahito and Choso ran out first. After everyone left, the twin sisters suddenly arrived. They did not want Kenjaku to continue manipulating Geto Suguru's body, but Kenjaku paid them no heed. They warned him that he would regret it. This was when Kento was most furious. Watching his friends fall one by one, Kento could no longer remain calm in the face of these cursed users. Reality had pushed him to a breaking point. Just after splitting from Yuji and others, Kento hurriedly went outside the tent where several auxiliary sorcerers had already been killed by the enemy. Seeing Ijichi lying in a pool of blood, Kento's anger reached its peak, and he quickly took him to the hospital. Meanwhile, Mei Mei and Yuji also dealt with the cursed users around them. The outer curtain of the Shibuya district had been removed. Yuji intended to meet with Aino, but at that moment, Ino unexpectedly fell from a high building, having been defeated by the enemy. An old woman had used a spirit descent technique to resurrect Toji with the intention of having him continue to kill Yuji Fushiguro. However, the spirit descent technique suddenly lost control. Be careful whom you command. To prevent this, she had only allowed the physical descent of the spirit, but ultimately, Toji's body overpowered his spirit. Meanwhile, Maki and others were still exercising the cursed spirits in the basement. They too realized that something unexpected had happened outside the curtain. Consequently, Nobara and Aratanita hurried to a shopping mall. Haruta blocked their way. Nobara wanted Aratanita to leave first, but Haruta used a cursed tool to stop her. Seeing this, Nobara ran to Aratanita's side without hesitation, intending to confront Haruta directly. However, Haruta's weapon was quite tricky, and Nobara was knocked down with a punch. The two were in a dire situation as Haruta began to torture Arata Nita. Just as he was about to kill them, Kento suddenly arrived. Seeing the weapon in Haruta's hand, Kento was certain that Ijichi had died at his hands. Haruta tried to counterattack, but in the next moment, Kento punched him away. At that moment, Haruta also realized that something was amiss. If he hadn't used his technique just now, he would have already become a corpse. Kento could no longer control his emotions and smashed his fist into Haruta with tremendous force. But just then, Haruta's weapon flew over from behind. Fortunately, Nobara arrived just in time to block it. Kento decided not to show mercy anymore. Meanwhile, after dealing with the curse users, Mei Mei directly went to the lowest level of the subway station, where Kenjaku had been waiting for a long time. Mei Mei looked at Geto Suguru before her, filled with confusion. She had thought that Gojo Satoru should have killed him earlier, but she soon dismissed this idea. Just then, Kenjaku summoned the special grade cursed spirit, Smallpox Deity. If Mei Mei could exercise it, she would qualify as a contender against Kenjaku. After doing this, Geto Suguru left the area. At that moment, the cursed spirit instantly activated its domain. Mei Mei realized the seriousness of the situation and was soon trapped inside a coffin. The cursed spirit intended to seal her in, but in the next moment, Mei Mei became excited. It had been a long time since she faced an opponent that threatened her life. Just then, Yuji successfully entered inside the curtain at the station entrance, which was crowded with cursed spirits. Feeling helpless, 
Yuji was suddenly joined by Tog, and together they made their way inside the station. However, as he entered the second underground level, Choso, who had been waiting there for a long time, quickly attacked Yuji. His enhanced blood even exceeded the speed of sound, with terrifying power and speed that Yuji could not defend against physically. At that moment, Choso asked him if his brother had any last words before dying, but Yuji said he only saw him shed tears. Hearing this, Choso instantly exploded with rage and unleashed his full power. His body burst out with copious amounts of blood, gradually forming a sphere. Yuji quickly stepped forward to stop him, but he was still terrified of Choso's blood manipulation technique. Eventually, Choso completed the charging of his blood. The two distanced themselves, and Yuji realized the severity of the situation. If the attack hit, he would undoubtedly die. Yuji then leapt into the air, and Choso also launched his skill, thinking he would hit his target. However, in the next moment, Yuji easily dodged. He continued to close the distance between them. As they neared each other, Choso launched a new technique, catching Yuji off guard. By the time he reacted, Choso was already prepared for the next attack. It seemed the strike would penetrate Yuji's body, but due to insufficient compression, the blood's power significantly decreased. Yuji was caught in a dilemma. Then, just at that moment, Mekamaru spoke up, suggesting Yuji run into the restroom. Without hesitation, Yuji dashed into the restroom, with Choso following. Choso thought Yuji had no escape, but suddenly the manipulation technique went out of control. The presence of water caused massive cellular destruction, and 45% of the blood components lost control, preventing Choso from manipulating the blood outside his body. Seeing his chance, Yuji began his counterattack. The two exchanged blows in the confined space, gradually with Yuji gaining the upper hand. In the next second, seizing the opportunity, Choso unleashed his technique, and Yuji's liver was pierced. Observing this, Choso intended to press his advantage, but unexpectedly, Yuji didn't fall. Instead, he wrapped his fist in his own blood and charged again into the fray. Yuji was gradually pushed back, but then found a chance to cover his opponent's eyes with his hands and launched an attack with his injured left hand. However, in the next moment, he froze on the spot because Choso had anticipated his move. Yuji's strike landed on Choso's crimson blood armor. By this time, Yuji had lost consciousness, and Sukuna was disdainful, thinking Yuji's life was at its end. However, Choso stopped his attack as the fusion of blood gave him memories he had never experienced before, revealing that Yuji was his half-brother from the same father. Meanwhile, Mei Mei was dragged into a domain by Kenjaku's special grade curse spirit, Smallpox Deity. The curse spirit's technique could seal an opponent inside a coffin. If Mei Mei couldn't escape the coffin within three seconds, she would succumb to illness and die. Already hit once by a tombstone, two more strikes would mean she wouldn't leave alive. Mei Mei then transferred her cursed energy to a crow, but in an instant the crow was sealed in the coffin and swiftly obliterated by the tombstone confirming Mei Mei's suspicion that the Cursed Spirit targeted the strongest cursed energy within its domain. To eliminate the Cursed Spirit, someone needed to divert its attention. Just then, Ui Ui stepped forward, drawing the Cursed Spirit's focus. As it prepared to seal him, Mei Mei suddenly appeared in front of the Cursed Spirit and in a swift movement, chopped off its arms. Mei Mei had allowed Ui Ui to risk his life to enable her to use her technique. The Cursed Spirit then vanished from the domain, and Mei Mei cautiously surveyed her surroundings. However, the curse spirit attacked her again, and with a single strike, Mei Mei slashed the special grade curse spirit. This was her blackbird manipulation technique, which no one but Gojo Satoru could withstand. Simultaneously, Kento and Maki, along with others, reached the basement where, unexpectedly, they encountered another curse spirit. Before Kento and Maki could react, Naobito had already turned the cursed spirit into a specimen, and then with a punch, he sent Dagon flying. Kento was perplexed by the sight, and at that moment, Dagon began vomiting uncontrollably, scattering white bones all around. Slowly, Dagon writhed, undergoing a startling transformation. It turned out that Dagon was previously in a cursed womb state, and had now evolved into a cursed spirit. Kento and Maki distracted Dagon while the old man launched his technique thinking they would easily exercise it. However, 
Dagon remained unscathed, its health seemingly infinite. Then, as the three simultaneously struck at Dagon, it flew into the air. The old man kicked it back to the ground, achieving this level entirely through his powerful mirror ability and sense of timing. Just when they thought it was over, Dagon opened its domain, and suddenly, the surroundings turned into a vast sea with countless Shikigami attacking them. This technique was different from ordinary attacks, as within the domain, Shikigami could emerge endlessly. Kento and Naobito were completely restrained when Dagon was about to annihilate everyone. Suddenly, Fushiguro Megumi appeared from behind it, bringing a weapon for Maki. Seeing this, Dagon initially wanted to eliminate Megumi first, but with Maki's interference, its accuracy greatly decreased. Kento also moved to Megumi's side. As long as they could maintain the current situation, they had a chance to defeat Dagon. However, it was clear that Megumi's body was reaching its limits, so he prepared to forcibly tear open the domain to let everyone escape. But just as he was opening the domain, Fushiguro Toji suddenly entered through the portal. Just because the person didn't bow low enough, the man struck, causing blood to spray from his head. Did you think kneeling on one knee was enough? This was Jogo's closest moment to death. To successfully revive Sukuna, he took out 10 fingers at once. As the last finger was swallowed, Sukuna fully awakened. Seeing this, Jogo quickly retreated. But in an instant, Sukuna took his left arm. This is Sukuna, an overwhelming evil. Just now, Megumi successfully broke into Dagon's domain. He intended to tear open the barrier and transport everyone outside. But at that moment, Fushiguro Toji arrived. Everyone was confused because they couldn't sense any cursed energy from him. Then Toji casually snatched Maki's weapon. As a puppet resurrected by the summoning technique, he should have ceased to exist after the caster's death. But due to various coincidences, the technique lost its termination opportunity. Now, Toji had become a complete combat doll, only stopping when his body was destroyed. This is the killing intent aimed at the strong. So the moment he stepped in, Dagon became the primary target. The two began a fierce battle. Countless Shikigami crazily lunged at Toji. The once powerful cursed spirit was now powerless. Dagon was beaten back repeatedly. Then Toji charged at him again. They engaged in a close combat. Dagon was helpless against Toji's weapon. At this moment, Megumi's cursed energy was nearly exhausted. But for the sake of victory, he had to hold on a bit longer. Toji began sharpening his weapon, transforming it into a new one. Dagon realized the dire situation, so he tried to stall for time. Once Megumi's cursed energy was drained, he could kill everyone here. Dagon leaped into the air without hesitation. The old man suddenly appeared behind him. He had already seen through Dagon's intent. Toji leaped into the air. The old man kicked Dagon towards Toji, who instantly pierced him with a sharp weapon. Thus, Dagon was exorcised by Toji. They all returned to reality. Toji slowly approached the group. As they were still in confusion, Toji threw Megumi out. Maki wanted to chase after him, but Jogo had already arrived. Seeing Dagon exorcised, Jogo was filled with rage. He decided to kill all the sorcerers here. He suddenly appeared in front of Kento. The old man couldn't sit idly by, so he used curse techniques to teleport frantically. But with a casual wave, Jogo turned the old man's body to char. As Jogo prepared to deliver the final blow, Sukuna's sensing suddenly shocked him. It turned out that Nanako and Mimiko were giving Yuji Sukuna's fingers. Jogo rushed over following the sensing. Seeing Sukuna's mark still present, Jogo had a bold idea. If Yuji swallowed 10 fingers at once, Sukuna would temporarily take over his body. He took out a scroll with 10 fingers and fed them all to Yuji. However, the next moment, Jogo's arm had already disappeared. Sukuna had fully awakened. Seeing this, Jogo quickly retreated. His power was completely different from Gojo Satoru's. Everyone was too scared to move. Anyone in front of him had to bow down. Meanwhile, the two sisters began to beg him to kill Kenjaku. If Sukuna helped them, they would reveal the location of another finger. But Sukuna mercilessly killed them. Jogo was terrified. He wanted Sukuna to quickly form a pact with Yuji for control over the body. But Sukuna scoffed at the idea. He already had his own plan. 
To thank Jogo for the Ten Fingers, Sukuna said he would help if Jogo could touch him. The King of Curses, Sukuna, had returned. Jogo thought Sukuna's technique was cutting and slashing, but Sukuna was also a master of fire. In the end, Jogo died by the flames he knew so well. Just now, the fight between Megumi and his father was about to begin, but they both sensed Sukuna's presence. Megumi wanted to use his technique to escape, but Toji's speed was too fast. Megumi was no match for him. He started to run frantically. Even without cursed energy, Toji could always find him. Just as Toji thought the fight was over, a pipe inside the building burst. Megumi used a Shikigami to launch a surprise attack, but it had no effect on Toji. He wanted to buy time. Then, Toji charged at Megumi again. If he missed this chance, Megumi would die. Toji's weapon pierced his body. At the same time, Megumi drew a long sword. As he was about to strike, Toji stepped back. His heart was filled with shock. The boy in front of him was his son. He had once made a deal with Zenin K. If Megumi joined Zenin and awakened his technique, Toji would receive a large sum of money. Toji thought it would be better for Megumi to join Zenin than stay with him. So he agreed. Toji asked Megumi for his name. Upon hearing the answer, Toji seemed relieved. He then ended his own life with his weapon. The technique was undone and Toji's body returned to its original form. Megumi rushed to Maki's side, but Haruta launched a sneak attack from behind. Meanwhile, Panda was outside looking for an entrance to the fifth underground level. They encountered several sorcerers. As they prepared to fight back, an explosion occurred outside the city. Sukuna and Jogo's battle had begun. To get Sukuna's help, Jogo risked his life to challenge him. But reality was harsh. Jogo was no match for him. Atsuya and the others sensed the danger. Any mistake could result in instant death. As they were about to flee, Sukuna appeared beside them. He ordered them not to move. Breaking the command would have severe consequences. At this moment, Jogo's fireball was approaching them. Sukuna was still counting down slowly. As he clapped his hands, everyone fled the battlefield quickly. The massive fireball destroyed the entire area. Jogo thought this attack would hit Sukuna, but Sukuna dodged it at the last moment. Sukuna asked why Jogo didn't use his domain. Jogo admitted that even using his domain wouldn't secure a victory. Hearing this, Sukuna became interested. He decided to defeat Jogo using Jogo's own specialty. Jogo stayed in place, realizing his opponent was also a master of fire. Left with no choice, Jogo used his flames. This was his last chance to gain Sukuna's help, but in an instant, Jogo was defeated. Mahito became their final hope. Sukuna watched Jogo silently. Suddenly, a figure appeared behind him. It was an old acquaintance. Just now, Megumi was pushed to the brink by the sorcerer Haruta. In desperation, Megumi decided to summon the strongest Shikigami, Makora. No sorcerer in history had ever tamed this Shikigami. Megumi's action was tantamount to suicide. Makora's first strike put Megumi in a near-death state. Then, it turned its focus to Haruta. As Makora was about to kill Haruta, Sukuna suddenly arrived. To save Megumi, Sukuna had to defeat this Shikigami. The battle began quickly. Makora slashed fiercely at Sukuna, but Sukuna dodged in a flash. Sukuna then used his slashing technique on Makora, but it had little effect. Makora recovered instantly after each cut. Sukuna grew more interested. He increased the power of his slashing technique, but it still couldn't harm Makora. The two continued their intense battle. The destructive force shattered Shibuya. Makora integrated cursed energy into its attacks. Sukuna was shocked that the Shikigami could see through his moves. He started using rapid slashes. Skyscrapers fell before this phenomenal power. Sukuna figured out Makora's ability. It was the strongest predictive adaptation. In the past, Sukuna might have lost, but now he was much stronger. Domain expansion. This domain didn't separate space with a barrier. It materialized the domain. Within a 200 meter radius, all of Sukuna's attacks would hit. Makora inside the domain would be constantly cut by two types of slashes. The only way to defeat it was to use an unfamiliar move and kill it before it adapted. Sukuna used his flames again. An explosion centered on Makora lit up Shibuya like the sun. Makora was finally defeated. Shibuya lay in ruins. 
Sukuna brought Megumi to the principal. Yuji's consciousness reawakened. Seeing the devastation, Yuji was devastated. All of Sukuna's actions were imprinted in his memory. At this moment, Yuji only wanted to die, but he quickly calmed down. He had no choice but to fight. This was Kento's loneliest moment. Jogo's flames had burned half of his body. Yet, as a sorcerer, Kento still clung to his beliefs. Seeing the pitiful transformed humans before him, Kento made his final decision. Like a soulless zombie, he swung his short knife aimlessly in the underground station. One by one, the transformed humans fell around him. Kento was like a merciless killing machine. After he had dealt with all the transformed humans, Mahito suddenly appeared behind him. He realized his life was at its end. Though Kento felt all he had done was in vain, his kind nature led him to find peace. Yuji, it's up to you now. Yuji watched everything in a daze. His anger had driven him to the edge of sanity. He charged at Mahito furiously. Yuji only wanted to tear Mahito apart, but Mahito summoned his transformed humans again. Yuji intended to punch them, but hesitated at their pleas for mercy. The cursed spirit suddenly sprouted countless spikes. Yuji used his body to deflect them. Mahito unleashed a series of transformed humans. Yuji was flung out like a cannonball. The cursed spirit's body grew larger, filling the entire corridor. A cut appeared on Yuji's face. He couldn't tolerate Mahito's casual disregard for human life. The two clashed again. In the confined space, Mahito's curse techniques had the upper hand, but Yuji wasn't as easy to deal with as Mahito thought. The next moment, both emerged from the curse walls. Mahito, with his transformed body, attacked Yuji wildly. Yuji suddenly hid in an elevator. As the elevator descended rapidly, Yuji prepared for battle. The next moment, Mahito burst through the elevator ceiling. In the cramped space, they exchanged punches. But Yuji couldn't land a blow on him. Yuji noticed Mahito's attacks were more varied than before. He needed to end the fight quickly. Mahito began to flee. Yuji chased him without hesitation. Turning a corner, two humans greeted him. Yuji wanted them to leave, but they transformed into curses and attacked him. Yuji was thrown out again. Mahito's goal was to exhaust his spirit. If Yuji's spirit broke, they would secure another victory card. Meanwhile, Nobara encountered another Mahito outside. When he gambled with Jogo, he unlocked his clone. If he killed the woman before him, Mahito could crush Yuji's spirit completely. Nobara was unaware of the impending danger. Nobara used resonance again. Mahito's clone suffered severe damage. This clever strike prevented Mahito's sneak attack on Yuji. Yuji began a frenzied counterattack. Mahito, weakened by the resonance technique, couldn't fight back. Just before this, as Yuji climbed the stairs, Mahito flung several people at him. Yuji wanted to save them, but the transformed humans exploded. Yuji sensed danger immediately. Mahito appeared behind him. Meanwhile, Nobara continued fighting Mahito. Although it was just a clone, its combat power was no less than a grade one curse. To prevent Mahito from touching her soul nails, Nobara kept her distance. Mahito noticed this. As a clone, he could change his shape, but couldn't touch her soul. So, he decided to exhaust her energy. His hand turned into a blade and slashed at Nobara. The powerful strike injured her arm. Just as Mahito thought the fight was over, Nobara fired several cursed nails around him. Mahito was puzzled. Suddenly, the nails on the ground pierced his body. Nobara jumped above him and drove the cursed nails into him. She then used her resonance technique. This attack severely damaged Mahito's body. Yuji felt Nobara's cursed energy. He launched a frenzied counterattack. Because of Nobara's technique, Mahito couldn't fight back. Each of Yuji's punches was filled with hate for the curse. In this war, he couldn't save anyone. Despite this, Yuji chose to keep fighting. As Yuji prepared to finish Mahito, Mahito's body suddenly split. Yuji couldn't locate the real Mahito. Mahito escaped. Meanwhile, Mahito's clone, heavily injured by Nobara, also fled. Nobara chased after it. As they entered the subway corridor, Mahito and his clone reunited. Yuji was shocked but realized Mahito's plan when he saw Nobara. Run, Nobara! Mahito's real body touched Nobara's soul. Yuji punched him into the wall. In just two and a half seconds, Nobara recalled her life. Her face began to mutate. Nobara fell before Yuji. You couldn't imagine that Mahito, a curse, landed the most devastating black flash. Yuji watched Nobara fall, breaking his spirit. 
The contrast between reality and his ideals suffocated Yuji. Mahito seized the chance and charged at him. This time, he wouldn't give Yuji a moment to breathe. Black Flash. The powerful strike left Yuji incapacitated. Mahito began to torment him. Mahito's twisted heart found satisfaction in this. As he prepared to end Yuji's life, a clap sounded nearby. Mahito was shocked. At this crucial moment, Aoi Toto arrived and saved Yuji. Mahito was stunned but quickly recognized Aoi. Aoi once pushed the special grade curse Hanami to the brink. At this moment, Aoi woke up Yuji. He wanted him to stand and fight, but Yuji's spirit had already collapsed. He blamed himself for the death of his comrades. Mahito attacked them. Aoi used his boogie-woogie technique to dodge easily. He then kicked Mahito away. Interesting, Aoi started helping Yuji regain his faith. As long as they, as sorcerers, were alive, their fallen comrades hadn't truly lost. Finding meaning or reason in each death could sometimes desecrate the dead. They entrusted everything to you. You don't need to find the answer immediately, but you must not stop. Yuji realized the truth. Aoi was indeed a true mentor. Just then, Aratanida used his technique on Yuji and Nobara. Yuji's injuries were temporarily relieved. Nobara still had a chance to survive. Hearing this, Yuji's fighting spirit reignited. At this moment, Aoi charged at Mahito. With Boogie Woogie, Mahito was disoriented. But he quickly adapted. Mahito threw a curse at Aoi, trying to force him to use Boogie Woogie. Instead, Yuji appeared before Mahito. Yuji apologized for his despair and using guilt as an excuse. He turned his sorrow into strength. A black flash struck Mahito. After a long time, the duo was back in action. They launched a flurry of attacks at Mahito. Aoi's non-living object switching surprised Mahito. Mahito tried to draw the battle into the basement. His soul power was still at 40%. Aoi's switching troubled him, so he targeted Aoi. They exchanged blows in the complex basement. Mahito tried to touch Aoi's soul, but Aoi's agility was superior. Mahito was kicked into an elevator. Aoi and Yuji regrouped. Yuji threw a rock at Mahito. Aoi used Boogie Woogie to switch in front of Mahito. Both Yuji and Mahito used Black Flash. Aoi didn't want to fall behind. Encouraged, Aoi landed a Black Flash on Mahito. All three tapped into their full potential. Mahito realized it was time to go all out. He taunted Yuji, becoming nearly insane. No one could use Black Flash at will, but Yuji was different. With Aoi's support, Yuji struck Mahito with another Black Flash. This time, Yuji focused all his cursed energy. Black Flash! The battle between Mahito and Yuji reached its peak. Aoi and Yuji were in sync. After a brief standoff, Aoi used his technique to bring Mahito in front of him. Yuji attacked immediately. Mahito detached his head to evade. They attacked Mahito's body relentlessly. Mahito used multiple soul-modified humans. Combining weakly rejected souls, he created a new multi-soul entity. At this moment, Aoi noticed Mahito's cursed energy distribution. He used Boogie Woogie to send Mahito to Yuji. Aoi then dealt with the powerful modified humans. He thought he could quickly defeat them. But the next moment, the modified humans knocked Aoi away. These multi-soul entities gained explosive power by burning their souls. Their attack power far exceeded ordinary curses. They had strong power but died in one hit. Just then, Mahito retracted his clone. He wanted to finish Yuji while they were separated. Countless curses rose from the ground. Yuji was thrust into the air. The curses attacked him like mad dogs. Yuji kicked at Mahito, but Mahito threw him away. Mahito tried to press his advantage, but Aoi arrived. Mahito knew he needed to deploy his domain to touch Aoi, but using the domain would get him devoured by Sukuna. So Mahito decided to mimic Gojo Satoru and use a 0.2 second domain expansion. Domain expansion. Both Aoi and Yuji were shocked. Aoi quickly used his simple domain. Meanwhile, Yuji ran towards Mahito. He wanted to interrupt Mahito's technique, but Mahito suddenly targeted Aoi. His arm started to morph. Aoi quickly cut it off. To protect himself, he had to. Then Mahito appeared before Aoi. Though his technique was temporarily disabled after closing the domain, he still landed a black flash. Mahito succeeded in hitting Aoi with a black flash. Aoi shielded his abdomen with cursed energy but was still heavily injured. Mahito's technique restored. He charged at Aoi again. This blow was expected to be fatal. 
but he faced Yuji instead. Aoi had touched Mahito's technique with his hand. His hand was badly damaged, but it was a miracle he managed it. Aoi's body reached its limit. Yuji continued to fight, inheriting Aoi's will. Meanwhile, Mahito took a black flash hit, but finally grasped the essence of his soul. Transfiguration, true form. This was his transformed state. After using the black flash, he found his soul's essence. The two clashed again. Yuji thought only Mahito's appearance had changed. But when his fist hit Mahito, he realized he was wrong. Mahito's body was harder than Choso's blood armor. As Yuji tried to retreat, Mahito's body morphed. A blade-like spike cut Yuji's arm. Mahito didn't want to give him a chance to breathe. He charged at Yuji again. They exchanged blows in the open space. Mahito had reached a new level. Gradually, Yuji fell behind. Mahito's transformation left Yuji with no chance to counterattack. To defeat him, Yuji needed to use maximum cursed energy for a black flash. This was his only way to win the battle. Mahito hadn't realized the danger approaching. He launched another attack at Yuji. The terrifying power sent huge waves across the lake. Mahito tried to ambush Yuji, but Yuji was already prepared to unleash a black flash. Mahito quickly distanced himself, startled. He now believed Yuji could use black flash at will. Mahito decided to confront Yuji head on. He charged behind Yuji. As Yuji threw a punch, Mahito met it with his own fist. Yuji's attack caught Mahito off guard. As Mahito tried to strike Yuji with his other hand, Aoi suddenly appeared. Mahito thought Aoi would use Boogie Woogie, but Aoi was deceiving him. Mahito's attack missed. Yuji's black flash hit Mahito solidly. Mahito was now completely incapacitated. Yuji was no longer the emotional boy he once was. He vowed to exterminate all curses. Mahito was terrified. But just then, a figure appeared. Ghetto Suguru. This was Mahito's most desperate moment. Yuji and Aoi's perfect coordination had utterly defeated him. Mahito desperately tried to escape. But Yuji's killing intent engulfed him like winter's chill. Mahito thought his life was over. But then, another figure appeared before him, Kenjaku, the mastermind behind the Shibuya incident. Mahito clung to him like a lifeline, hoping for salvation. But Kenjaku absorbed Mahito using cursed spirit manipulation. Moments earlier, Kenjaku had appeared before Mahito. Upon hearing Ghetto Suguru's name, Yuji realized Gojo Satoru was within him. Yuji charged at Kenjaku. As Yuji neared, Kenjaku summoned his cursed spirit, Great Catfish. Instantly, Yuji felt like he had fallen into an abyss, but to others, he just collapsed. This was the unique feature of cursed spirit manipulation. It can control multiple curses simultaneously in battle. If the technique is seen through, Kenjaku can summon new curses. Yuji charged again. Kenjaku summoned another curse without hesitation. The powerful impact prevented Yuji from approaching. If Geto Suguru hadn't divided his forces during the night parade of a hundred demons, Okatsu wouldn't have won. It would have been Geto Suguru's victory. Yuji was now covered in injuries. As Kenjaku marveled at Yuji's physical resilience, Mahito suddenly attacked from behind. Born from humans, Mahito understood Kenjaku's thoughts well. He aimed to strike before being absorbed, but Kenjaku was prepared. Yuji was shocked. In the next moment, Kenjaku turned Mahito into a vortex. This technique, second only to a domain, merges absorbed curses into a high-density attack. Initially, Kenjaku thought it was an ordinary technique, but he later realized its true value. The technique allows for the extraction of abilities after consuming the vortex. At this point, Momo discovered Kenjaku's location. Kamo, upon hearing the news, immediately shot countless arrows at him. A huge explosion erupted around Kenjaku. Although Kamo's attack hit, it seemed to cause no real damage. As Kenjaku distanced himself, he also blocked Mai's bullets. But before he could celebrate, Kasumi appeared behind him. This strike was crucial. She poured everything from the past and future into it, even if she could never wield a blade again. She drew her sword. Kenjaku was prepared. He instantly countered Kasumi's draw. Kenjaku then used his vortex technique. A curse resembling Mahito charged at her. It seemed Kasumi was doomed. But at the next moment, Atsuya and others arrived. They successfully blocked the vortex's impact. Choso also appeared. His heart was pounding wildly, all because of Kenjaku. 
Choso's parents included his mother, a curse that planted the seed, and Kamo, who injected blood during his mother's pregnancy. Everyone was shocked to learn that Gato Suguru was the most dangerous sorcerer of the Kamo family. Choso's anger reached its peak. As he prepared to attack, Uraume appeared. Choso didn't hesitate. He wanted to be a good brother. This shocked Kamo. In the next second, Choso's blood cutter shot at Uraume. Although Uraume caught it barehanded, she felt immense pressure. Choso launched a more ferocious attack. Influenced by red blood manipulation, he could sense his brother's changes no matter the distance. Death is the greatest change for living beings. He had felt Yuji's death keenly. So, without a doubt, Yuji was his blood-related brother. As a brother, he couldn't tolerate Yuji being toyed with. The two were in fierce combat. This was the best chance to reclaim the domain. Just as they prepared to attack, Uraume suddenly activated her technique. Everyone was instantly frozen. Kenjaku told her to keep some alive. He needed someone to deliver a message. At that moment, Yuji broke Choso's ice. Momo seized the chance to attack Kenjaku and Uraume. Uraume responded with a more powerful curse technique, freezing everyone again. As Uraume was about to kill everyone, something unexpected happened. It was Tsukumo Yuki. A girl was eating furiously in an abandoned convenience store. Suddenly, a figure appeared at the entrance. Curious, the girl approached. As she stepped out, a curse lunged at her. It seemed the girl's life was over. But at the last moment, just then, special grade sorcerer Tsukumo Yuki saved the day. They talked about the evolution of curse techniques. Tsukumo Yuki believed the next stage for humans was to be free from cursed energy. Kenjaku thought it was the optimization of cursed energy. He believed Tsukumo Yuki had given up on this idea after Toji's death 12 years ago, but now it seemed she hadn't. Tsukumo Yuki just returned to her true self. The optimization plan has a major flaw. It relies on the Tengen barrier. Only people in this country can optimize their cursed energy into sorcery if they use the Tengen barrier. This would cause significant trouble. However, Kenjaku didn't care. He didn't want a world without curses, nor did he want a peaceful, ideal world. He wanted a new world filled with chaos and endless possibilities. At this moment, Kenjaku's technique extraction was complete. Tsukumo Yuki realized the danger. A curse lunged at the girl. Kenjaku successfully activated Idol Transfiguration. Mahito's technique couldn't be used remotely before, but it evolved during his battle with Yuji. Thus, Kenjaku successfully marked two types of humans with evolutionary potential. One type is like Yuji, who absorbed cursed objects. The other type is like Yoshino Junpei, who has a technique but a non-sorcerer brain structure. Kenjaku transformed these people's brains into a sorcerer's structure. Through idle transfiguration, he deepened their understanding of cursed energy. Afterward, these people would kill each other. Simply put, Kenjaku released a thousand evil Yujis. At that moment, Uram's technique suddenly deactivated. She used reverse curse technique to gain a physical body upon revival. Now, Uram was poisoned by Choso's blood. Although everyone broke free from the bindings, Shibuya had already fallen into the abyss. From now on, the world would be dominated by curses. Countless curses suddenly appeared on the ground. Kenjaku vanished into the darkness with the prison realm. Yuji shouted for his teacher. Kenjaku looked forward to the future days. He would usher in the golden age of sorcery again, the Heian era. Afterward, Shibuya went into complete blackout mode. All citizens were in panic. After complex deliberations, the high officials decided to reveal the existence of curses to the public. Meanwhile, a little girl was eating furiously in a convenience store. As she was enjoying her food, a figure appeared at the entrance. The girl was curious. She thought the person could help her find her mom. But as she stepped out of the convenience store, a giant curse lunged at her. The girl was petrified. Just then, a figure jumped down from the sky. The curse was instantly defeated. It was the pure love warrior, Okatsu. As he comforted the girl, the curse revived. But before it could attack, Rika instantly obliterated the curse. Since the Shibuya incident, the higher-ups began to act. Okatsu was ordered to kill Yuji. 
Gojo Satoru was exiled from the sorcery world due to the Shibuya incident. Geto and Yaga were sentenced to death as the orchestrators of the Shibuya incident.